Good evening, everyone. This is Tanya Cantlow. I am the counsel to the borough president. Also uh, joined on this WebEx tonight is Richard Barrett, who is our land use director, and Ina Gusenfeld, who is the land use coordinator. Please note that my opening remarks and the portions of this proceedings of the third calendar item will be followed by translation in Spanish. Viewers may join the hearing via the attendee link and password on the following slides, which also contain information for those wishing to join by phone. Please note that this information will be shared through the hearing. I will pause at times to allow for timely trans translation. Buenas tardes y bienvenido a la audiencia pública del procedimiento de revisión del uso uniforme de la tierra del presidente Arms, que se realiza a través de la plataforma de videoconferencia de WebEx. Tengan en cuenta que mis observaciones iniciales y la parte del procedimiento del tercer punto del calendario serán seguidas con traducción al español. Los visitantes pueden unirse a la audiencia a través del vínculo del asistente y la contraseña en las siguientes diapositivas que también contienen información para aquellos que deseen unirse por teléfono. Tengan en cuenta que esta información se compartirá durante la audiencia. Haré una pausa en tiempos para permitir una traducción oportuna. There are three items on the agenda this evening. Each item will commence with a presentation, followed by questions from the borough president's office. We will then open the item to public testimony. Those interested in speaking may address their request to the host in the WebEx chat. Attendees may also submit comments to ask Eric at brooklynvp.nyc.gov for Borough President Adams' consideration. Hay tres temas en la agenda esta noche. Cada artículo comenzará una presentación seguida de preguntas de la oficina del presidente Eric Adams. Entonces abriremos el artículo al testimonio público. Aquellos interesados en hablar pueden dirigir su solicitud al anfitrión en el chat de WebEx. Los asistentes también pueden enviar comentarios para preguntar a Eric Brooklyn bp.nyc.gov para consideración del presidente Arms. Please note that this virtual hearing is being recorded to comply with the public law for transparency. It will be available for viewing on Borough President Adams' One Brooklyn channel on YouTube. Tenga en cuenta que esta audiencia virtual se está grabando para cumplir con la ley pública de transparencia. Estará disponible para ver virtual en YouTube One Brooklyn de Borough President Adams. We will now pause the tr Spanish translation until we reach our last calendar item. Ahora pausamos la traducción al español hasta que lleguemos a nuestro último calendario. Please call the first item and let us begin. Calendar item number one, two one zero one three zero ZMK. 210131ZRK and 210132ZRK. These applications submitted by the Department of City Planning for zoning map and text amendments to ensure flood resiliency of future development in the Garrison Beach neighborhood and special Sheepshead Bay District of Brooklyn Community District 15. Such actions would change the zoning on approximately 20 blocks from R4 C3 and C-1 C2-2 commercial overlays to R4-1 R3A and C2-3 commercial overlays and establish a new special coastal risk district 
in Garrison Beach. For Sheepshead Bay, the proposal would eliminate the arcade bonus and below, excuse me, below grade plazas. Community Board 15 voted to approve these applications on November 17th. We remind viewers that if you wish to testify, you must use the message, the host in the WebEx chat and indicate your intent to speak. After the presentation and question and answer portion, we will call speakers in order of chat requests. Would Kate Richard, the representative for the application, please state your name for the record and present the application. Hi, this is Kate Richard. I'm a resiliency planner with the uh, Brooklyn office in the Department of City Planning. Um, I don't appear to have the ability to share my own screen. Oh, you're on it. Thank you. <laughs> All right, um, thank you for having me to present tonight. Um, so I will be talking about Resilient Neighborhoods Garrison Beach, which is a project proposed by the Department of City Planning, a zoning map amendment and zoning text amendment in the neighborhood of Garrison Beach. This project has been referred out for public review alongside a citywide text amendment, zoning for coastal flood resiliency, and a text amendment in the neighborhood of Sheepshead Bay. Next slide, please. Uh, Garrison Beach is located in Community District 15 of Brooklyn. It's map, uh, marked in orange in that small map on the left. Uh, Garrison Beach was studied as part of DCP's Resilient Neighborhoods Initiative, and the proposed actions were developed in consultation with local elected officials and a community advisory committee. The neighborhood is bounded by Marine Park to the east, Shell Bank Creek to the southwest, and Plum Beach Channel to the southeast. Uh, the area was largely undeveloped until the early 20th century when a summer resort of one-story bungalows was constructed. By the 1930s, the rest of the uh, neighborhood was occupied with summer bungalows built close to or on small lots with no yards. Over time, these seasonal buildings were converted to year-round two-story residences. Next slide, please. Gertson Beach is a residential neighborhood characterized primarily by single family detached homes with some semi-detached and attached two to three story buildings in the northern portion of the neighborhood. One story commercial buildings are located along Gerritsen Avenue, which is the community's only commercial corridor. This uh, neighborhood is currently zoned R4 with C3 on the waterfront and C12 and C22 commercial overlays on Gerritsen Avenue. Uh, the neighborhood is served by two bus routes along Garrison Avenue, running to downtown and midtown and to the Kings Highway BQ subway station. Garrison Avenue is also the only street that provides access to the entire neighborhood. Next slide, please. The existing zoning permits one and two family detached, semi-detached and attached homes, as well as multifamily buildings with side yard requirements ranging from eight to 16 feet. On Garrison Beach's narrow and small, shallow lots, this can lead to small buildable areas. However, the majority of homes in Garrison Beach were constructed before these requirements were put into place. Many lots have very small front side and rear yards. The small detached homes typical of this neighborhood often occupy the majority of the lot area with only a couple of feet between the property line and the building facade. Next slide, please. Uh, some of Garrison the unique built conditions in Garrison Beach have implications for flood risk and resiliency. Bungalows that were originally built for seasonal use are now occupied as year-round permanent residences. Streets as narrow as 20 feet can pose safety risks and accessibility issues during emergencies. Garrison Beach has many sunken lots with residential uses below the design flood elevation. This increases vulnerability to coastal flooding, especially with the neighborhood's high design flood elevations. Narrow lots pose challenges for existing zoning compliance, as well as difficulties when applying some flood resilient construction standards. The current zoning permits multifamily development in neighborhood vulnerable to flooding and with only one main road for egress. Finally, the current zoning limits commercial uses on Garrison Avenue. Some businesses that could support residents and homes in flood preparation and recovery, including plumbing, electrical, and appliance repair are not permitted today. Next slide, please. These neighborhood characteristics combined with Garrison Beach's physical flood risk make the neighborhood particularly vulnerable to coastal flooding. 
The majority of Garrison Beach is within the 1% annual chance floodplain or A zone. Next slide, please. Uh, the map on the left shows in light green the extent of flood inundation during Sandy. Um, and as you can see, almost the entire neighborhood was inundated. The map on the right shows projections for daily tidal flooding in Garrison Beach as soon as the 2050s, shown in purple, and uh, in pink, the projections for 20, the 2080s. Next slide, please. Uh, DCP proposes a zoning map amendment and zoning text amendment to address these resiliency challenges. Zoning map amendment would replace the existing R4 zoning with R41 zoning, replace the existing C3 zoning with C3A zoning, and replace Garrison Avenue C12 and C22 commercial overlays with C23 overlays. The zoning text amendment would establish a Garrison Beach Special Coastal Risk District. Next slide, please. Uh, in the proposed R41 district, no new attached or multifamily development would be permitted. A reduced side yard requirement would allow for more efficient building layouts and more contextual flood resistant development in Garrison Beach. Under a C3A district, the existing mix of water dependent and residential properties along the neighborhood's waterfront would rem remain in conformance with zoning and would not face obstacles from zoning regulations if they were to undergo resiliency retrofits. C3A's residential equivalent district is R3A, which like R41, permits one and two family detached buildings and has reduced side yard requirements. Uh, this proposed rezoning would also rationalize the limits of the maritime commercial district to the higher risk waterfront area. The new C23 overlay would expand the permitted commercial and retail services to include home maintenance and repair that would be useful in disaster recovery and rebuilding. The underlying zoning in this area would remain R4. Next slide, please. The proposed Garrison Beach Special Coastal Risk District would modify the proposed R41 and C3A zoning district regulations to further restrict the density and scale of future residential development. Only single family detached homes would be permitted on lots less than 3,000 square feet. Two family development would be allowed on larger lots. Residential building height would also be limited to 25 feet above the reference plane. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so all these proposed actions are intended to improve resiliency in a neighborhood that is vulnerable to coastal flooding uh, through expanded permitted commercial uses that would be helpful in storm preparation recovery. Um, as well as new zoning districts and the new special coastal risk district, which would help maintain appropriate limits on density in an area of current and future flood risk while promoting contextual resilient construction in Garrison Beach's small lots and narrow streets. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we were also asked to talk a little bit about Sheep's Head Bay. Um, like I said uh, at the beginning, this is a separate project, but was referred out for public review at the same time as uh, the project in Garrettson Beach. And this is a proposed zoning text amendment in Sheepshead Bay. Uh, like Garrettson Beach, Sheepshead Bay was also studied in DCP's Resilient Neighborhoods Initiative. Through this study, we found that the special Sheepshead Bay district presents unique conditions and zoning requirements that uh, were not applicable to the citywide approach of the uh, text amendment zoning for coastal flood resiliency. This special district was established in 1973 to promote and strengthen the unique character of this waterfront area as a prime location for water-related commercial and recreational development. The special district offers some floor area bonuses for developments that provide public plaza open spaces. However, the special district rules were developed before we were thinking about resiliency in design. The proposed amendment here would change some of the rules in the Special Sheep's Head Bay District to improve resiliency, design, and accessibility. Next slide, please. Uh, more specifically, the proposed text amendment would encourage flood resilient and active design in future Sheep's Head Bay uh, Special District open spaces by no longer allowing plazas to be located below grade. The current rules allow buildings to receive a floor area bonus if they provide open spaces low grade, um, and some of these sunken plazas experience serious flooding during Sandy. It would improve the consistency of public space across the district by consolidating what are now separate types of open space bonuses. 
would eliminate a bonus for arcade spaces or covered walkways, which tend to produce enclosed spaces that don't support the goal of active commercial streets. And finally, it would set clear and improved standards for how future plazas are designed to ensure that they are accessible, provide elements like seating, trash bins, and drinking fountains, and have uh, plantings that can handle occasional saltwater flooding. Um, none of the lots affected by this text amendment are currently being developed. These changes are just meant to produce improved spaces if any of these properties were to be redeveloped in the future. Um, on the right, you can see two drawings. These are just examples of the types of spaces that might be developed under the proposed new rules. Next slide, please. Um, so both of these uh, proposed actions in Garrettson Beach and Sheepshead Bay, along with the citywide zoning text amendment, zoning for coastal flood resiliency, um, have been referred out to, um, for the local actions, Community Board 15, for the citywide actions, all community boards in Brooklyn and all five boroughs. Um, and we are now going through the public review process. Does that conclude your presentation? Yes, sorry, it does. Thank you, Ms. Richard. Thank you again for your um, presentation. So I have two questions for you. Mm -hmm. First question, um, in order to comply with new guidelines for flood resiliency, property owners may have to take out construction loans on top of their existing mortgages as the combined monthly payments could present a financial burden. So would the city consider providing real estate tax incentives to offset, offset the additional costs? Um, I want to clarify first that uh, the proposed uh, changes here wouldn't introduce any new costs to homeowners in Garrett Beach. Um, currently, without these proposed changes across the 1% chance floodplain everywhere in the city, any property that is built new or is substantially redeveloped has to meet the Appendix G building code requirements for resiliency. Um, and the land use actions in Garrettson Beach don't um, don't make any modification to that. The zoning changes here are intended to add flexibility so that if homeowners are investing to meet that requirement, they can create a building that fits in with the neighborhood's character um, and meet resiliency standards that can even exceed Appendix G so that they reduce their flood risk and uh, potentially reduce their flood insurance costs. Um, but to address the main part of your question, um, we know that None of these types of resilient construction uh, efforts are easy or cheap, but allowing this type of flexibility is still important so that property owners can make investments over time. And so new buildings are as resilient as possible. Um, the primary goal is that this zoning is no longer an obstacle for homeowners if they are making these investments. And the city is also advocating to the state and federal government to put money in the hands of homeowners so that they can make investments uh, but for proposals like property tax relief, the city requires on other levels of government um, and we can face long and certain timelines for approval. So what we are doing now is trying to provide zoning relief as one step to help uh, support resilient construction and help home homeowners potentially lower their insurance costs. Thank you. Richard, did you have any? Yeah, I, I just want to add that, you know, obviously these homeowners are going to have a new insurance cost. And the only way to reduce it is to take on these improvements consistent with the zoning you're proposing. But if you can't afford either of them, that's a problem. So just that's the cross to the question. How do we help people that really can't afford the insurance and they can't afford to take on the existing mortgages? Um, there are some other resources available. Flood Help New York provides uh, New York City residents with um, information and assistance on flood risk, flood insurance requirements, and um, they may be eligible for some free services uh, to help with resiliency in their homes. Um, and resiliency retrofits may also be eligible for low interest or no interest loans through the Department of Housing Preservation and Development's Home Fix program. But again, the, the proposed changes in Garrettson Beach are, are not introducing um, new requirements that don't already exist in terms of meeting Appendix G. Does that answer, I mean, satisfy? I, I didn't know if Richard had any follow-up. <laughs> I, I just want to make sure. Um, you know, it, it's 
still an issue again mm -hmm. with the rules, right? So the bottom line is when all the rules are in effect to help people modify their home, if they don't have the money to raise to make these improvements, they're going to be hit up with the flood insurance costs, which they also can't afford. So again, that's the issue. How do we deal with people to help them take advantage of the rules you're putting in place? Thanks, uh, understood. And the city is continuing to advocate for, for assistance um, at the state and federal government. So the last question, a, a limited number of major alterations to date have met uh, flood resiliency standards. What assistance would the city provide for owners whose properties will require major alterations to meet the new rules? Um, mentioned the, the HPD home fix program uh, can offer low interest or no interest loans to, to some households and flood help New York helps with some of the, the more technical aspects um, including home resiliency and counseling, uh, getting elevation certificates, valve installations for your home, um, things like that. Okay. Thank you. That concludes my questions. Thank you, Ms. Richards, Thank for you. your presentation. Again, if you wish to testify, you must use the message host in the chat and indicate your intent to speak. Do we have anyone that would like to speak in the chat? No one has indicated intent to speak on this item. Okay. If no one wishes to speak, uh, Richard, can you please close this calendar item? Calendar item number one is closed and on the full text, the Brooklyn Borough Board will have its hearing and its vote at the uh, January meeting early, in early January. Uh, I'm not sure if the date has been set yet. Calendar item number two, two zero zero three five six PPK. This application submitted by the Department of Citywide Administrative Services on behalf of the New York City Economic Development Corporation, pursuant to Section 197-C of the New York City Charter for the disposition of approximately 98,500 square feet of development rights from a Department of Transportation site located between Front and York Streets under the Manhattan Bridge Roadway. Such action would facilitate the merger of two city-owned zoning lots with the adjacent privately owned lot at 69 Adams Street. The requested disposition would result in approximately six floors of commercial office space within a 25 story as of right mixed use development in Brooklyn Community District 2. The application also seeks a permanent easement to ensure light and air for residential uses above a certain limiting plane on, on the DOT site. Community Board 2 has not yet taken a position on this application. Borough President Adams will hold off on making any decisions until he hears from the board. Again, we remind any viewers that if you wish to testify that you must indicate that in the chat. After the presentation and question and answer portion, we will call the speakers in the order of the chat request. Would Ricky Da Costa, the representative for this application, please state your name for the record and present the application. Yes, thank you, Tanya, uh, uh, Richard, and the rest of the uh, team. Um, and good evening, everybody. Uh, uh, I believe uh, team is pulling up the presentation. That was beautiful. Um, okay, so yeah, good evening, everybody. Uh, uh, thanks for giving us the opportunity to speak. Uh, I, uh, as Tanya stated, am Ricky DaCosta, uh, representing the New York City Economic Development Corporation, um, who is representing the city on this application. Uh, as Tanya stated, the application is uh, for the transfer of city-owned development rights from a uh, uh, lot, a DOT uh, lot under the Manhattan Bridge to uh, the Rapsky Group for their otherwise as of right uh, residential project. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, you can go to the next one. 
Uh, okay, so, uh, and I'll be relatively brief, and then I'm going to hand over to Stephen Hayes and Ray Levin, uh, who are representing the Rapsky group for this application. Just to give a little context, this uh, project is a result of an RFP that was put out in 2017 uh, to encourage the growth of commercial office space and jobs outside of the core Manhattan business districts. Uh, 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 Rapsky group was selected in 2019. Uh, and, you know, this is uh, a unique one because it's otherwise uh, unusable development rights from the DOT lot that's under the bridge um, where there isn't, you know, potential to do a ton of building. And uh, we are happy that um, we were able to secure an agreement with Rapsky to produce commercial office space um, here in the, you know, growing Brooklyn Tech Triangle. Uh, Stephen will talk a little bit more about uh, both program uh, for the building itself and you know, what they're looking to in terms of tenanting goals, but uh, it will very much be aligned with uh, kind of the existing tech triangle types of uses. Um, you know, and because of of the city's involvement in this uh, in this application, we we're able to secure commitments for local hiring and uh, MWB participation on the project. Um, you know, I, I'd obviously be remiss if I didn't say a word about uh, kind of the context that's around us. Uh, Stephen will speak a little bit about how it's affected the, the design and the program otherwise, but, you know, looking forward, uh, this is a project that's expected to be delivered in 2023 uh, when we, uh, you know, anticipate that there will be uh, need for commercial office space in Dumbo. I mean, it's one of the neighborhoods that, you know, we have seen uh, there's still demand there for this type of use. Um, and so I think it, it continues to make sense. And, and obviously, uh, any project that produces jobs is uh, going to be important in, in the time that we're in and as we look towards recovery. Um, last thing I want to talk about is, you know, we've uh, with a number of neighborhood groups uh, and stakeholders uh, to talk about the project. Uh, they have raised a number of issues that are uh, of critical importance that I just want to acknowledge, uh, even if I don't have an answer tonight for how we plan on addressing them. But, you know, we are aware uh, of the community's interest in uh, in addressing uh, both the uh, lots uh, under the DOT bridge, uh, under the Manhattan Bridge for public access and uh, the desire uh, for improvements uh, to the, the York Street app station. Um, so again, I don't have answers tonight as to how we might be able to address those, but that's something that we're doing diligence on as, as this project's move forward, and, and hopefully we can have something more to say on that later uh, in the process. Um, so at this point, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Stephen and Ray to talk a little bit more about uh, the Rapsky Group and the proposed project. I just want to interrupt briefly to acknowledge that we have representative from council member Steve Levin's office. Glamani Bravo Lopez is listening in as well. So I just wanted to recognize Glamani on behalf of Steve Levin. Great. And uh, can you all hear me? My name is Stephen Hayes. And if we could go to the next slide, I'll, I'll continue on with the presentation. Um, so again, my name is Stephen Hayes. I work for the Rapsky Group, which is the owner of 69 Adams Street and the purchaser of the commercial air rights from the city property that is adjacent to 69 Adams Street, which is the subject of this of this jeweler. I want to first start. Um, first, I want to say thank you to uh, the community uh, board land use committee and the folks of the community we spoke to and uh, the borough uh, president's office and uh, all of you who are, are spending time and uh, consideration on this. Euler of action. We know it's a, a strange time with many personal challenges, and we are grateful for the time that you've put on this or into this. And uh, I want to echo what Ricky said. We had uh, the community board land use committee meeting, uh, and we heard very loudly and very clearly some of the concerns and issues that they have with this project and um, with the process involving the project. And we are fully committed to work with EDC and city and state agencies that are relevant to solving these issues um, to to get um, to address them as, as soon as possible. Um, I wanted to start by just telling you a little bit about the Rapsky Group. Uh, the Rapsky Group is a Williamsburg-based developer that was formed in 1993 by Yadler Rabinowitz and uh, Simon Dushinsky, hence the name Rapsky. 
And besides the development arm, it also has a construction arm and a property management side, and all three will be involved in the 69 Adam Street project. Uh, Rapsky is a substantial company with over $2 billion of development, and that includes over 2,000 residential units um, in New York City, many of which are in mixed use buildings. I wanted to also uh, introduce some of the team members who are on the call. The architect is Fisher McCooey, and um, uh, Ehab El Sharif is on the call. The environmental consultant is Philip Abib Associates, and uh, Lisa Jordy is on this call, and land use counsel is Herrick, and Ray Levin, and Rob Huberman are on the call. I'm going to pass this over to Ray in, in just a second to talk about the um, the land use actions or the the ULERP actions. Um, one thing I did want to say, though, with regard to project team is, is we have heard through conversations that we've had with various community members that there has been on other projects a lack of communication of appropriate communication between developers and projects, particularly during construction in this community. And we, we want to we want to not have that happen here. So we, we are we will have a dedicated staff person who will be the primary point person and facilitator of communication between the community and the and us particularly during construction but also on onward and we'll keep we're going to keep the the um community informed of uh the different parts of the construction as it goes goes ahead and listen to any kind of issues and you know uh, impacts that can be mitigated through us quickly so um on that introduction i want to pass this over to ray uh and on to the next slide Uh, good evening. My name is Raymond Levin. I'm with uh, the law firm of Herrick Feinstein. We are a land use counsel to the Rapsi Group. Um, I want to start off by just emphasizing that we are not here about a rezoning. Um, this this district is and will remain a mixed use uh, M15 R91 uh, district with a five FAR for commercial and a nine FAR for residential. Um, as you can see on this drawing, lot four is privately owned vacant land. Um, under existing conditions, it, uh, it could support a 285 foot tall building with approximately 225 residential units, uh, encompassing about 156,000 square feet of floor area. Um, what's being proposed here is the merger of uh, lot four with the city owned property, which is striped in this uh, drawing. Uh, they are lots 15 and 17. Uh, the merger of those uh, would be, um, uh, I'm sorry, they would be the merger of those. Uh, th those the 15 and 17 uh, lots are, um, are owned by the city and DOT uses them uh, basically for vehicle storage and parking and has a very small uh, building on that site, uh, shown at that sort of gray square. Uh, the only other property on this block is the Beacon an apartment building, 23 stories tall, uh, built maybe um, uh, 10, 15 years ago. Um, the merger will allow uh, the city to sell approximately 98,000 square feet of commercial floor area associated with their lots uh, to be used on our lot, on lot four. Um, the, uh, and uh, I guess that's it for, uh, for this. The, the, um, the transfer development rights would be accomplished through a zoning lot uh, development agreement, uh, which would be entered into between um, the Rapsky Group and, and the City of New York uh, upon a, approval of this uh, ULERP option. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so here's, here's the technical aspects of what we're asking for. Um, we are, uh, in order to create the uh, zoning lot merger and effectuate the transfer of the office development rights, um, we require a ULERP action authorizing the disposition of those rights. Um, the approval, the, also being asked in order to have um, legal windows on the portion of, of uh, the lot four building that will face the bridge. Uh, we're also looking for a grant of a 30 foot wide uh, light and air easement starting above the roadway on the Manhattan Bridge, which is shown in the sort of the red uh, stripes on this uh, on this drawing. 
Um, <clears throat> the uh, that that's that's all we're asking for. <laughs> um, pretty straight, uh, straightforward from uh, from that point of view. What this allows is uh, the use of ninety eight thousand square feet of commercial floor area for offices that would otherwise not be uh, usable since it's under the bridge. Uh, there would be sufficient uh, floor area remaining on the city lots to allow them to uh, develop um, uh, buildings in support of city services should they uh, desire to do that. Uh, at the moment, we are unaware of any, any, uh, any plans to utilize the development rights that uh, will remain under the, uh, under the bridge. Um, and now I'll turn it back over to Steve. Thank you. And if we could go to the next slide. Um, I wanted to uh, just talk about the program in the building. Uh, as Ray mentioned, the, there are four components of the program. Ray talked about the residential piece, which is the as of right piece, meaning it's the part that Rabsky already owns on the 69 Adams Street um, property. And uh, it's going to be 225 market rate rental units. Uh, we haven't determined the exact uh, unit type yet. That'll, that'll come down the line as we get closer to markets we understand demand. Um, the, the, drawing to the, the drawing to the right is uh, an elevation uh, drawing where you're standing on Adams Street looking at the building. Front Street is perpendicular to this on the left side of the drawing and the bridge is behind it. Um, if you look at the bottom right of the drawing, there's a, a, uh, a little door. That's a parking uh, garage entrance. I'll talk about that in a second. Just to the left of that is the residential entrance. Every component of this project will have a separate uh, lobby and entrance on the building. Um, that's the residential one. The next portion of the project is the office component. I'm going to talk about that in a second, but the door to that is just to the left of the residential door that I just pointed out on this drawing. Um, the office component, which is the subject of this ULURP, is, is a, um, we're designing it to, or we're, we're creating it, developing it to be office space to continue with the creative tech sector that is or has been um, doing quite well and expanding in in uh, Dumbo and in the immediate area. Uh, and that obviously was expanding uh, quite well up until COVID. Um, so I did want to talk about office and COVID because a question came up certainly at the community board, a land use committee meeting and others have asked the same question, like why office now? And um, uh, Ricky pointed out this project is going to be coming online three years from now. Hopefully, most likely in a post-COVID uh, um, world. And I don't. I'm not saying that to diminish what we're going through right now, which is really awful. But we are planning for you know three years from now when we we will not be in this situation. Um, so certainly, uh, sectors in the office market are looking at office. Uh, demand, you know, and sort of reevaluating at present, but there are sectors that are already know that they want to come back to office to offices and that includes the creative tech sectors because um, basically because efficiencies and creativity are both waning right now working remotely and doing zoom calls or webinars. It's not the same as going into a conference room, rolling up your sleeves and coming up with ideas and, and um, you know, and, and plans and, and um, planning for futures. So we do know and we believe strongly that this demand, as soon as we are able to get back to offices, we'll get back into offices and continue to expand in, um, in particularly in Brooklyn. We're very confident about Dumbo and Brooklyn for this exact reason. It's a resilient place that has a demographic and uh, a, a, a office um, component that, that will respond quickly. And so we, we're investing in that and we believe in it. Um, the other two components of the project are the parking component, which that's the entrance that I pointed to initially, which is the bottom right side of the drawing. Uh, that's a 90-spot parking garage on the second floor. And then the ground floor is retail, which is approximately 900 square feet. Uh, I did want to talk a minute about retail. Um, one of the things that we have heard about or heard from uh, talking to people in the community about retail is uh, a desire to really focus the retail along Front Street, to continue the Front Street corridor that is now sort of existing on both sides of the, of the bridge, but, um, you know, sort of with a, with a missing tooth per se on where we are at present. So 
we're going to concentrate the retail along Front Street, and it's planned to be small, perhaps cafes. It's going to be designed to be flexible. We do not have retail tenants at the moment, but uh, the plan is to continue and build off of what Front Street already has and will have as soon as um, even more healthy situation as soon as COVID is, um, is over. So if we could go to the next slide, I wanted to talk about design because the design is informed by the different programmatic elements that I just mentioned. One other item that we've heard from the community and in, in discussions is that there is a view that um, some of the newer buildings in the area have been architecturally unresponsive to the rest of Dumbo. And we clearly don't want that to be the case here. We want to create a both a programmatic and architecturally um, responsive and cohesive building that works within the context of, of Dumbo. And uh, the drawing or the rendering is to the right here. And I want to just take a couple minutes to just explain it a little bit. We, we looked at context, architectural context in uh, Dumbo, and there's clearly, uh, we can clearly be informed by certain materials, colors, texture, shape, things I've written on this slide that we use to, um, to uh, add to the uh, facade. So it, there's, an, there's an understanding of its neighbors reflected in the facade. Also um, reflected in this building is that there is a diverse group of uses in this building. And that's very uh, common in Dumbo, more than perhaps other neighborhoods with this mixed use in one building uh, um, situation. So we wanted our building to reflect the mix of uses. So we divided it into four pieces. And I'm going to walk you through these four pieces pretty quickly. The first is, again, this drawing, by the way, is looking at the corner of Adams Street and Front Street. And you can see the bridge in, in the background. The first uh, portion of the building is the retail and the public realm portion on the ground floor. And that's obviously, well, I shouldn't say obviously, it's, it's transparent in terms of materiality. It's um, open, accessible. Uh, it has a lot of street trees and other planting, signage, lighting, uh, things that, that will help enliven that, that uh, corner and the two uh, streets. Um, just above that is the second part of the building, which is the commercial component of the building. And that sort of ends on the uh, the ninth floor, which is sort of the indentation of the building, which creates these balconies to go to the third portion of the building. That sort of capping of the commercial meets exactly where, not exactly, but very close to where the bridge uh, is on the other side of the building. So that where the bridge, it, it sort of moves into a balcony situation and indents in that, that third portion of the building, which is the um, we're call it, calling it a transition section architecturally, but it's where a lot of the amenity space is for uh, the um, community, for the office space, as well as the residential pieces. And it also houses some mechanical um, uses so we can remove them from the roof and do something else with the roof. And then the fourth portion of the, the building is the residential portion that is above that goes up to a interpretation of a cornice. And uh, then there's a, a, a roof that is yet to be um, programmed, but there's a lot of roof there and there's a lot of opportunities um, on the top of the building. So that's the design. And if we can go to the next slide, um, I wanted to talk about job generation. Uh, and this is the last thing I'm going to talk about in terms of the project. So obviously job generation is important to, to um, pretty much every community at the moment. Um, and what we have heard in discussions with, with uh, this community is that the uh, jobs that are being created should be um, occupied by local people to the extent possible. So um, I put an estimation of the job generation uh, job numbers that would be generated from this project underneath, which is approximately 250 construction jobs and 270 uh, other jobs, mostly commercial. Those will be permanent jobs. Because this is an EDC project, as, as Ricky mentioned, there are two um, hiring programs that we need to adhere to uh, contractually. One is a local hiring plan, and the other is the is an NWBE participation in construction plan. And I want to talk about both of those very briefly. The local hiring plan has two components in it. One is uh, for construction, and one is for operations. So that means local people will be hired in you know, during construction and then ongoing operations. Uh, there's a variety of processes and mechanisms that EDC has has helped um, developers employ to encourage local hiring, and we're certainly going to take advantage of that knowledge 
one thing, what, as one example I listen here is um, for this community is uh, we're going to be working with a NYCHA's, NYCHA's Office of Reese because there are NYCHA projects or NYCHA developments here. Um, it's a good opportunity to, and we've already done this, we've spoken to a Reese office to start the ball rolling on hiring during construction from people who live in, in uh, those communities who have construction backgrounds. And this is a great resource because Reese has database that has all these people uh, listed experiences. Uh, they have suggestions of job training uh, to get local people to be hired um, during construction. So that's one example of, of what will be ha happening in terms of local hiring. And then the second program is NWB participation uh, during uh, construction contracting. Again, there's a variety of mechanisms and processes that EDC has employed through this program that we'll be taking advantage of to encourage um, NWB participation in the in the construction of the building. Uh, so that's that's it. We go to the next slide, and we're we can talk about. Uh, I can answer some questions, or Ricky can answer some questions. I just want to say, just I want to emphasize that we we've heard the community issues and concerns, and we are sincerely making efforts with EDC to address those. And we we're really because we're really excited about this project and we're bullish on Dumbo, as I mentioned, and Dumbo's future. We want to be we want to invest in it. We want to be part of it in a in a sensitive way. So thank you all. And I'm, I'm finished with the presentation. OK, thank you, Ricky, Stephen and Raymond for your presentation. So I have about four questions. So I'm not sure. I guess you'll decide who will take what. <laughs> um, so. The first question, um, community members have expressed a view that the proceeds of this disposition should fund local priorities, such as improved access to the York Street F train station and streetscape restoration projects, including DOT perimeter enclosures and property retrenchment. So what possible mechanism would ensure that the funds are directed toward these uh, enhancements? Yeah, so I can take this first one. Um, thank you. Um, so, yeah, you know, as I and Stephen mentioned, we heard loud and clear uh, and we understand the concerns that have been expressed by folks in the community and, and wanting to make sure that this is uh, a project and a transaction that benefits local residents. Um, you know, I think I, uh, I just want to add to that that, you know, it's important to bear in mind that the general fund of the city is used to Pay for things like infrastructure investments, uh, programs and services uh, in Dumbo as well uh, as you know other neighborhoods around the city. Um, but you know, again, we we hear folks. Uh, we are welcome conversations about any specific improvements that that could be made um, as a result of this project moving forward. Um, you know, we've already done some diligence uh, with the Rabsky team and our our agency partners. We're going to continue to do that diligence. Uh, 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 so that we can, you know, hopefully have more to say as the process moves forward about tangible improvements that uh, that could be made to to benefit the residents of Dumbo uh, and neighboring communities. Okay. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you. Um, the second question is: the right development of the site would yield 100% market rate units in lieu of affordable housing. Could the proceeds of the disposition help fund capital improvements of it? Existing housing stocks, such as the nearby um, Farragut has it. Yeah, so, um, you know, the, uh, the possibility of affordable housing on the project hasn't um, been ruled out yet. Um, but I will say, uh, you know, we're open to. To, you know, as I said before, we're open to ways that this project could benefit residents of, of Dumbo and neighbor, neighboring communities. Um, um, so that would obviously be uh, a thing that we would continue to do some diligence on um, as the process moves forward to see if there's, you know, a tangible impact that, that we could make there. And the third question, has there been any consideration to set aside a portion of the ground floor, commercial ground floor space for, you know, um, maybe local businesses or nonprofit organizations or arts or cultural um, institutions? I can answer that question. Um, so, uh, our tenanting plan includes having some 
arts and cultural related uses in the uh, upper floor commercial component of the project, along with the creative tech um, companies that we have already planned. And there's clear synergies among these groups. And we believe that uh, the environment and the atmosphere will uh, foster productive creative interaction as well as potentially uh, beneficial business relationships. So we can certainly, we'll certainly um, consider and setting aside some of that space for short-term or long-term uses um, for not-for-profit cultural users at below market rent. Um, and we welcome the opportunity to talk about that with um, about possible tenants and about possible space that's needed. In terms of the ground floor retail, small businesses are what we intend to have in the ground floor retail. And we can certainly provide this space at less than market uh, value, depending on the tenancy and appreciating that small local businesses uh, need initial support. So we welcome the opportunity to discuss that and research the specifics um, to, to allow local uh, retailers to, to tenant our space at discounted rates. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, and the last question actually, so uh, sustainable and renewable energy is very important to the borough president. Uh, what consideration has been given possibly in cooperation with DEP or the mayor's office of sustainability, NYSERDA, to incorporate passive house design, uh, blue, green, or white roof covering and wind um, turbines or DEP rain gardens? I, I can answer this as well, or try to answer it. Um, okay. um, 69 Adams Street is going to be a lead silver building and will achieve the city objectives for energy efficiency and sustainable design. Um, and we'll do this through the strategies from the agencies and the law that you just referenced in the question. For example, we are looking at NYSERDA's Greening New York report and its building efficiency and sustainability programs, and we're going to incorporate some of those ideas uh, in this project. Um, as another example, will include passive house concepts such as adding insulation throughout the entire building envelope without any thermal um, bridging, making uh, it airtight and preventing infiltration of outside air and loss of conditioned air. And we're also going to employ high performance windows and doors. We're in the design stage now, obviously, so we're working it all through. I don't know the specifics of which which will be used. Um, we're also, because as I mentioned before, we have a, a, a large roof and and uh, some of the uh, mechanicals are not on it. They're in the middle of the building now. We certainly have the opportunity to add solar panels and turbines on the roof, and we are looking into this. Um, so that's a, that's a, a welcomed option as well. And um, in talking about ideas to minimize carbon emissions from Local Law 97, we are going to design the building and the utilities and engineering components of the building to meet the goal thresholds outlined in the law. Uh, as an example, we're examining different fuel sources and we're targeting fuels that will yield bigger carbon saving, bigger carbon savings, for example, natural gas or a combination of natural gas and others, and minimizing an all electricity or not having an all electricity building, which has the biggest footprint. And there, we're also um, looking at uh, training of building operations staff to um, understand efficiency best practices, and that includes obviously things like equipment scheduling, um, temperature setups throughout the day, those kinds of things that have been researched uh, previously and can certainly help us here. We're working with Stephen Winter Associates as a sustainability consultant, and we'll be adding other experts to make uh, 69 Adams as efficient as possible. And we can certainly keep the borough president's office, we will keep the borough president's office updated and the community as well on the specific measures that we're going to take to uh, create a sustainable and um, uh, building as the design proceeds. Thank you. So that concludes my question. So again, thank you, Ricky, Stephen, and Raymond for your presentation. Um, we will now <clears throat> turn our questions, or actually not our questions, our comments to the chat. So again, just reminding the viewers, if you would like to speak, you must put your message in the chat. Uh, Ina, is there anyone who would like to speak? Yes, our first speaker is Lincoln Wrestler.
And I'd like to remind that uh, Council Members Levin's office is represented. Oh, great. Lincoln. Sorry, I was muted by the host. I'm going to start. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you to the Office of the Borough President um, and the reps from the city and the Rapsky Group. I have very serious concerns about this proposal. As I understand it, there is uh, the developer has the ability to do 150,000 square feet um, as of right, and the city is handing over 100,000 square feet of air rights, and we're not getting anything in return. There are no community benefits in this proposal. Um, we do not need office space in Dumbo. We've recently seen the conversion of, I don't know, a million square feet plus of office space from the Watchtower buildings. There's a ton of vacancy. It is not what our community needs. Uh, there should also, this proposal has zero affordable housing. There should never be new development that is 100% luxury housing, let alone when the city is handing over 100,000 square feet in air rights. Um, there are very real infrastructure needs in Dumbo. Uh, most of all, the York Street Station. It is a death trap. Uh, every day, everyone files out of just one entrance. It is dangerous. We should be using the funds that are generated from this project to go toward um, uh, the capital uh, renovation at York Street, and we should make that happen. Um, the only other thing I would say is that DOT takes up a phenomenal amount of space in Dumbo by the Brooklyn Bridge, by the Manhattan Bridge, by the BQE, and they are not good neighbors. It is time that we have a full accounting of every square foot on DOT control and, and a plan for how they're going to share that, how they can do a better job of sharing that space with the community. Um, I want to ask the borough president to heed the Dumbo community and to oppose this uh, proposal. Uh, until we get real community benefits for our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bessler. Next speaker, Ina. Our next speaker is Caroline Perry. Hi, uh, good evening and, and thank you. My name is Caroline Perry and I am the real estate and planning manager at Downtown Brooklyn Partnership. On behalf of the partnership, I would like to express our support for the city of New York's proposed sale of unused development rights to Ratsky Group for commercial office use at 69 Adams Street. This action will facilitate the construction of new space to support continued job growth in Brooklyn in alignment with the mayor's New York Works jobs plan calling for investment in emerging commercial centers with strong access to transportation. The proposed mixed use model will include rental units built with as a right floor area and approximately 99,000 square feet of commercial office space via the transfer development rights, along with ground floor retail and 90 parking spaces. The new commercial uh, space will provide opportunities for additional expansion of the district's technology and creative hub and will be designed to provide safe work environments and reflecting evolving of market demand in the coming years. Furthermore, we believe that the proposed project will also create new jobs for the Brooklyn community through a commitment to local and MWBE hiring. Rapsky will work with the city's Economic Development Corporation to prioritize local hiring for both construction and permanent jobs with a 50% local hiring goal for permanent office jobs and will work closely with NYCHA and other community organizations to post open positions and recruit candidates. Uh, we know that Radsky is also committed to WBE hiring during construction at a level equivalent to 35% of the total development cost of the office portion of the project. For these reasons, we believe that 69 Adams Street is a project that will enhance the greater downtown Brooklyn area, support job growth, and bring additional hiring opportunities and investment to the local community. And we urge you to support this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Perry. Our next speaker. Yeah, I don't think we're seeing any other uh, people who want to speak on this particular item. If you want to let's call just, to this. Let's just double check with Ina. I just want to just to make sure. Ina, okay, there is someone. Uh, Okay, hold on. 
I do not see any other speakers on this item, though I have entered a message into the chat inviting others to announce intent to speak. I just wanted to make sure because I see some things popping up here. I'm not sure if it's for this item. Yeah, the last person responding to the chat, Theo uh, Chino did not say which item. He could message again to say whether you're looking to speak on this item or the next item. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Aaron Camino Smith. Hey, I think I sent the chat to everyone but the right person. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you, uh, Stephen, Ricky, and Ray, again, for your presentation. Um, yeah, I've been in Dumbo now for about a dozen years, and I think the biggest issue that was that Lincoln really said so eloquently is that Dumbo at this point does not have the access to transit that it requires, if that's buses, trains, whatever it is. And at this point, the York Street station really is a death trap. And it's gotten to the point where it was overcrowded years ago. And we're at a point with over a thousand residential units about to come online in the next year or two currently under construction. And this just adds even more. So the transfer of these air rights would add even more bodies into that station that is already overcrowded. It would be great to have a project like this, the idea of more retail, the idea of more offices and mixed use is fantastic. However, the neighborhood just cannot support it. And it feels like while it feels like Rabsky is trying to give back and what they're saying it, to me, and this is just my opinion, it feels more like they want to take advantage of this 98,000 square feet of office space and treat it more as a platform to elevate their residential higher up and get a much nicer view of Manhattan so they can just charge that much more for residential apartments. It's just my opinion, but I'm just saying it doesn't feel like something that is truly genuine as far as wanting to give back to the neighborhood when we know this neighborhood just cannot handle more people. I really fear that it's going to get to the point where the station will become so unsafe that we will begin to see weekly shutdowns of the station. It actually happened about six years ago during an art display. It was called Festival of Lights where the station was so crowded, the NYPD had to shut down the York Street station because it had become too dangerous for anyone else to go down into the station. It's a huge concern, and I don't know that even any givebacks from this kind of transfer would be enough to even make a dent in the kind of construction required to make that station safe. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Teo Chino. Hi, my name is Teo Chino. I run a website called Show the Book, and we are looking at all the corruption in the real estate industry in New York City. I am therefore opposing all over New York City now any development until a new elected city hall comes along to look at every development in New York City. We are calling for federal and state investigation of all HPD, private and public transfer with everybody in City Hall. So we are asking at this time that you put a moratorium in any other project in Brooklyn and every other county in New York City until we get a new City Hall that will look at the corruption within real estate. This is an example again where real estate gets first, community gets second. It is time we change things around where the community gets the first word on the need for the community and the real estate come and build upon the right of the community. The air right of the city, our community space, our communal space, which is called our air right, is giving and sold for free almost, penny on the dollar, with no community 
uh, involvement. Thank you for your time. Please do not. Uh, please do not move this project forward until we have a new city council. Thank you for your time and I will see you at the next level at the city council hearing and the community board. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Deborah Schaffer. And while we're waiting, I want to acknowledge the message. Suzanne Quint, uh, yes, I uh, have the message here. Yeah, sorry, it was it was uh, very hard to get a message through to anybody because anyway, um, yeah, I just want to say I'm, I've been a resident of Dumbo for eight years now, and I am unalterably opposed to this to the scale of this project. It's just it's so massive. 26 stories. You know, will tower over the neighborhood. I I can only echo everything everybody has said about the subways. I I feel like I'm taking my life in my hands every time I I go down there if it's anywhere near rush hour, which presumably will come back again in three years. I I don't think we need more office space. I don't think we need such massive, tall, overpowering buildings. There's already one going up on. Street, there's going to be another one on J Street. It's it's the it's it's a, a disaster what's happening um, in the neighborhood. And I think can can somebody just clarify me to, for me? Did they say 900 square feet of retail space or 9,000 square feet of real retail space in that plan? Can can one of the planners answer that? This is not a dialogue for that, so I'm sorry. Okay. Well, if, we'll it was, all right. if it was 900 square feet, that's a joke. That's I mean, I must have misheard. It must be 9,000 square feet because 900 would be it's nothing. It would be ridiculous. Um, anyway, I'm I'm really as a as a longtime Dumbo resident or reasonably you know um, longtime Dumbo resident, I'm I'm really really opposed to the scale and mass of this building. Eno? I see no other speakers. I think we should do one last call for anyone who may have had trouble getting through. So, so one person messaged me directly, so we'll call that person then. Suzanne Kent, if I pronounce it correctly. And, and after that, um, Melissa Prober. I think people are putting quite, uh, their comments in the question and answer, so you have to check there as well. There's a question and answer. I think people are putting uh, that they want to speak there. Hi, everyone. I'm Suzanne Quint. I'm a Dumbo resident. Um, and I want to just uh, acknowledge, uh, thank the developer for acknowledging the feedback that was received at the CB to land use meeting from the community. Um, speaking against this proposal, because as this proposal stands, um, Rabski and the EDC benefit at the expense of Dumbo's residents uh, and workers. Um, I want to just refute the benefit of um, jobs to the neighborhood. Um, you know, when you get into the building and the tenants and tech uh, tech businesses, you know, this isn't Wegmans that can will just you know can hire locally. These are going to be tech businesses with very specific requirements. Um, and I don't understand how. Uh, they will come back to hire directly from this community for those very specific uh, technical jobs. Um, I certainly want to underscore the concerns uh, with the York Street subway station that have been talked about extensively. That's um, extraordinarily real. Um, I also want to underscore um, what Lincoln raised about um, DOT being a partner to Dumbo in this neighborhood, the amount of land um, that they use, um, that they uh, that they have without community use um, is something very real that needs to be put on the table. Uh, and the last point I would just mention is just uh, the affordable housing and the fact that in 2020, um, you know, in 2020, in the situation that we're in in the city, did not have any affordable housing um, as part of this. 
um, or give backs to the larger community, um, the Brooklyn community in that way, um, you know, I think just really um, isn't isn't being a good partner. So um, for all of those reasons, uh, I uh, stand or speak in objection to the proposal. Thank you. Tanya, that last call was muted, I think, the, the name you wanted to call next. Melissa Prova, she indicated she wanted to speak in the chat. Okay. Is John F. indicated in the chat? If you're there, please unmute yourself. Whitney Hugh. That's another agenda item. That's on the 4th Avenue development. Okay. Uh, the last name we have is uh, John Feel, which was the John F. you called. So if that okay. person is still there. Okay. We also have Melissa Prober. Right, that's who I called, but no one said anything. So John F. is on, but he seems to be having technical issues. So I don't see his microphone. Is Melissa, is she available to speak? Hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. I had, couldn't figure out how to do that. Um, thank you so much. My name is Melissa Prober. I'm a Dumbo resident and co-founder of the Dumbo Action Committee. Um, I am also opposed to this ULERP in the current um, state. I, I don't think that the um the i'm sorry my children are in the background um i i don't think that um the there's a good partnership with the community um there's no no benefit to the community whatsoever as others have said um in addition to york street being uh unsafe the whole um neighborhood the, the streets the infrastructure as a whole can't support all of these developments we need a traffic study. Um, we we need to have um, EDC go and, and and negotiate real benefits to us. For example, the um, DOT giving up the four parcels in the area to help with pedestrian flow. Um, the money should be invested back into the community. And while I understand the residential portion is as of right. Um, as part of the negotiation, the Rapsky giving back um, as the higher floors should have insets to um, minimize the overall uh, landscape or um, of the neighborhood and the shadows that will be falling um, onto the streets of Dumbo. So I, I think that it should be um, opposed and that EDC and Rapsky need to go back to the drawing board and um, negotiate a deal that has real benefits to the Dumbo community. Thank you. John, are you available for that? Hi. Uh, I was here to speak on the 4th Avenue and I will speak on that as well, but I found out about this issue and, uh, and through this meeting as well, um, I'm in a neighborhood adjacent to Dumbo and I honestly think in the middle of a pandemic, we should oppose all ULERP uh, 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 processes or just put a giant pause on most development in New York City of this kind, especially I don't like uh, lopsided deals where the city gives away its property and its leverage to developers uh, to without much community benefit. Um, that's all I have to say on this. I'll probably speak more coherently and prescripted on my other issues. So, so we will call you John at a later sequencing in the order 
that we had you for the other item for calendar item three that we'll get to shortly. Okay, we have two more speakers. We have Dimitris Cezamentis and Mark Wooters. Yes, hello. All right, um, Dimitris here. I'm assuming everyone can hear me. Yes, we hear you. All right. Um, yeah, so I'm, a, I'm also a Dumbo resident. I'd like to speak briefly in opposition of the of the proposal. I think the point that um, I wanted to echo in particular was the point about um, the Rapsky group you know, needing to convince the community, which is unanimous in its opinion that, you know, this development offers no benefits and if anything exacerbates current problems, in particular the transportation problems, the Rapsky group should provide, you know, a much better argument as to why the this particular Euler of action is not just an attempt to elevate the building and create uh, more uh, expensive you know, uh, apartments with a view of Manhattan. I think, you know, once you sort of uh, put pen to paper, this, I think, to, to most people, and at least in my opinion as well, is uh, the primary reason for actually going ahead with this uh, Uberp. Uh, you know, there's empty office space. No one in the community wants offices. The effect of this Uberp will be simply to create more uh, real estate with better views. And uh, that's in addition to everything that's been said, that, uh, you know, is also a fundamental reason to oppose this. Mark available, I think that's who you indicated, Ina. Who's next to speak? Yes, and we also have Emmett Mendoza Gaspar. And while we're waiting for the speakers, uh, there's a comment about written testimony. So written testimony would get sent uh, easy way for email. Ask Eric at brooklynbp.nyc.gov. And uh, since Community Board 7 has submitted that item, we probably can still take written testimony for about two weeks. Since Community Board 2 has not yet voted, we probably could go at least three weeks, depending on when they submit after their vote. Ina, you know, Mark seems to be having technical issues. Who's the next one? The next speaker is Emmett Mendoza Gaspar. Hi, can you hear me? Hello? We can hear you. Awesome. Um, hi, my name is Emmett. I live in the adjacent neighborhood of Dumbo and Fort Green. Um, lived here for almost actually most of my life, about to be 24 now. Um, uh, I'm speaking against this rezoning, against um this development, because as we all know the history of New York City, especially around Dumbo um and Fort Green, like these communities of working class people have been displaced for years. Um, and it's pretty crazy right now in a time where we're living in COVID-19, where almost 92,000 people are living homeless um, in the streets at the moment. Before the pandemic, I believe close to half of New York City renters were rent burdened. And now that we're living in the pandemic, <clears throat> about a month ago, I believe the Daily News or reported that about 60% or 
of people who applied for rent relief were denied and the fact that we're pushing for more development that is not truly affordable, that is not truly equitable is <clears throat> a thing to slap to the face to many New Yorkers who call this city home. Um, I, I do agree with my the many peers who have spoken before me and I, I want to strongly um, urge the people here to please, please um, vote no against the rezoning on um, President Adams, you too. Please like mandate a rent more like rent cancellation until we're able to holistically change our current Euler process because at the moment the Euler process that we have workable the Euler process that we have is pro developer and pro construction. Um, thank you. And if Mark is not able to solve his technical in the moment, if he could get that solved during the next agenda item, we could take a pause to reopen item two to allow Mark to speak. Uh, we have one more potential speaker, Gary Burns. Gary also doesn't, oh, there he is. Yes, hello. We hear you. Okay, um, my name is Gary Wadu Burns, and um, I was just calling about the 4th Avenue project. Um, I worked We're in, not I, taking testimony right now on the 4th Avenue okay. project. Um, when that item's closed, you'll get called in your turns. So we're only taking speakers now. For 69 Adams, we're trying to complete that so we could get on to those who signed up earlier for okay. the Fourth Avenue project. There are many people that signed in ahead of you, so if you could defer right now, we'd appreciate that. Yes, thank you, Richard, uh, Mr. Richard Barat. Yes, thank you. If uh, Mark can call in as an alternative, uh, that's another way we could bring Mark into uh, having his remarks uh, spoken on the record. Sinead, I think, indicated, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, wants to speak, I think, on this item. Sinead Wadsworth. If you can unmute yourself. Richard, I think we should move on. Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Who's speaking? Sanad Wadsworth. Okay, yes, please. Mm -hmm. Hi, good, hear you. good evening. Thank you for your presentation um, on 69th Adams Street. My name is Sanad Wadsworth. I'm a council representative for the New York City District Council of Carpenters. And I wanted to ask if there would be the opportunity for union contractors to bid on this project so that careers can be provided for the immediate people in the neighborhood. And if the, and if the okay. so if excuse me, hold on one second. Yes. So this is not a we're not taking questions, just testimony. So this is not a oh. question and answer period. So if you have a statement or you know oh, testimony, sure. then that's it. Okay. I also would like to um, express my um, support for the project. Thank you. And your question was heard by the application team, so obviously they could uh, reach out to you separately, or you could reach out to them directly. If there are no more 
statements. Yeah, I see and one more. There's somebody. Go ahead, Ina. I'm sorry. There's somebody under the name of not one more block, but I'm not sure who that is. And uh, Karen Johnson, again, if we could provide a uh, a phone option, I guess, because apparently she can't get her audio sorted. So with Mark, if they were able to get phone access to us, uh, we could take them any point this evening if they'd like to try to reach out to us. Whoever not one more block is, does not have audio enabled. Okay, again, if they wanna to try to call in at a later point during this evening, and then we could take a pause on item three, but if not, if we're out of speakers on item two that can connect for the moment, uh, we can then uh, uh, close this hearing and move on to the next item. Okay, we will move on to the next item and resume Spanish translation. Please note that due to the number of anticipated speakers, we ask that you limit your remarks to two minutes and submit any additional comments to askeric at brooklynbp.nyc.gov. Okay, uh, calendar item. Calendar item number two is closed. Calendar item number three, 200029 ZMK, 200030 ZRK. And actually, I guess we'll go back. Um, the number of speakers were able to do three, right? Um, and uh, again, I'd like to acknowledge Councilmember Menchaca has been on the call, and I haven't seen that change, so he is still listening in to the best of my knowledge. Okay, thank you, Richard. This application submitted by 737 Fourth Avenue LLC, pursuant to sections 197-C and 201 of the New York City Charter for a zoning map amendment to change the eastern side of Fourth Avenue between 24th and 25th streets from M1-1D to R8A-C-4 and a zoning map amendment to designate the rezoning area mandatory inclusionary housing area. The requested actions are intended to facilitate a 14-story mixed-use development with 142 dwelling units and a ground floor retail in Brooklyn Community District 7. Approximately 35 units would be affordable households at 60, affordable to households, excuse me, as of area median income pursuant to MIH option one. The building would also provide approximately 45 below grade accessory off street parking spaces. Esta solicitud representada por 737 de, de la avenida Cuarta LLC de conformidad con las secciones 197C y 201 de la Cuarta de la Ciudad de Nueva York para una enmienda de mapa de zonificación para cambiar el lado este de la cuarta avenida entre las calles 24 y 25 de M1, 1D a R8A, C4 y una enmienda del mapa de zonificación para designar el área de reazonificación como área de vivienda inclusionaria obligatoria. Las acciones solicitadas tienen la intención de fa facilitar un desarrollo de uso mixto de 14 pisos con 142 unidades de vivienda y venta al por menos en la planta baja en el Distrito Comunitario de Brooklyn número 7. Aproximadamente 35 unidades serían asequibles para los hogares con un 60% de ingreso medio del área de operación número uno. El edificio también proporcionaría aproximadamente 45 espacios de estacionamiento, asesoría, accesorios 
fuera de la calle del bajo de grado. Community Board 7 voted to approve this application with conditions on November 18th, 2020. La Junta Comunitaria número 7 votó para aprobar esta solicitud con condiciones el 18 de noviembre del año 2020. We remind viewers that if you wish to testify, you must use message and you must message the host in the chat and indicate your intent to speak. After the presentation and question and answer portion, we will call speakers in order of chat requests. Los Recordamos a los visitantes que si desean testificar, deben utilizar el mensaje al host en el chat de WebEx e indicar su intención de hablar después de la presentación y la pregunta y respuesta porción. Llamaremos a los ponientes en orden de solicitudes de chat. For our Spanish speaking audience, please respond to the chat to request for tonight's viewing recording to have an applicant response and public testimony proved in English to be translated to Spanish as an additional subsequent viewing of tonight's hearing. Para nuestra audiencia que hablan español, responda al chat para solicitar la grabación de visualización de esta noche para que las respuestas se del solicitante y el testimonio público deben probarse en inglés para ser traducido al español como una vista posterior adicional de la audiencia de esta noche. But Eric Palatnik, the representative for this application, please state your name for the record application and do not rush your remarks so that our translators can capture all of your words for when this event is posted for subsequent viewing. Allow me to say, Eric Palatnik, el representante de esta solicitud, por favor indique su nombre para el registro y presente la solicitud. Y por favor de apresurar hablar para que los traductores puedan capturar todas sus palabras para cuando este evento sea público para visualización posterior. Hi, it's Eric Palat. Uh, Eric, just uh, one more second. I just want to acknowledge Councilmember Chaka. Acknowledge he is still here uh, listening in tonight. Thank you. Hello, good evening. I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time out of their busy schedules to, to listen to us and hear our presentation. Uh, most of the presentations to date have been done by our team, including Vivian Lee, who's on the phone with us right now. Uh, Vivian is going to be making the presentation and I am here, as well as Elizabeth Canella, as well as Tucker Reed from Totem, all part of the development team to answer any questions anybody may have. So in the interest of time, I'll hand my speaking time over to Vivian. Thank you, Eric, and thank you to the borough president and his team for the opportunity to present. I also want to thank all the community members who are here and engaged tonight um, on this project. Uh, I think, is there a present? Okay. Is their presentation. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so I want to start by introducing our firm totem and the team to you. Uh, as you all know, and heard, my name is Vivian Liao. I'm 1 of the principals of totem. We are a small Brooklyn based real estate and urban design firm. My own background is actually in journalism and communications. I spent a number of years working for the city and in the nonprofit world to help strengthen neighborhoods through economic development. You'll also be hearing from the rest of the team at different points tonight, but I'll just introduce them quickly again. My partners, Tucker Reed and Manuel Mencia and our amazing project manager, Liz Canella. We all have deep ties to Brooklyn. We live here, work here. Some of us have roots that go back generations in the neighborhood of Sunset Park, which is where this project is located. We started our uh, company five years ago, bringing our collective experience in government urban design and real estate to focus on local projects that benefit communities. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. Yeah, thank you. Um, the common thread tying our projects together is the approach we take to centering the voices of communities uh, in the places that we work. On this slide, you can see a few images of some of our projects. On the left is uh, what we call fast casual. Uh, that's uh, a, a new furniture line from our urban design firm 
um, where we have designed platforms that help activate uh, small businesses, restaurants, and retailers in the wake of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. In the middle is uh, the work that we did in San Salvador on crime prevention through environmental design, working to empower local entrepreneurships in the revitalization of a new park there. And then on the right is our work with bed restoration, um, working on the behalf to help guide them through a master planning process to re-envision their campus and help them achieve their mission of closing the racial wealth gap. Uh, next slide. In the same way that we have let the community be our guide in our economic development and urban design work, we have strived to do that here in Sunset Park to create the plan for this project. You can see our sort of general approach to development. First, we work to identify an opportunity or a challenge that we feel isn't being fully addressed uh, by the public sector. We do our research, we spend time listening and engaging with community, and then we partner with them to develop collaborative solutions that can help meet neighborhood needs, such as affordable housing and job creation. Uh, that's the project uh, process we've taken in here in this project as well. We spent the past 18 months working with the community, meeting with local stakeholders and the community board to take into account their wishes uh, to develop a project that benefits the neighborhood and helps set a precedent for future development here. On the next slide, uh, you can see the opportunity we're talking about is an underbuilt fast food chain and parking lot that sits right on top of a transit node in a neighborhood that is facing a housing crisis. Without using one cent public funding, we can bring approximately 135 units of new housing to this neighborhood, one in four of which will be permanently affordable to the residents who live here. Uh, I know for some, development is a bad word, and anything new somehow gets equated with the term luxury, but we believe that projects shaped by community dialogue and engagement, as this one has been, can turn brick and steel into real benefits for neighborhood residents. As a firm made up of former public servants deeply about Brooklyn, it's our fervent hope to apply private sector solutions in the service of communities. And we're stretching this particular building for everything it can give to Sunset Park realistically and quickly. So uh, next slide, please. Why is this so important? As you can see here from data that is pulled together by the Fifth Avenue Committee in a recent report they released, Sunset Park's population continues to grow, rents continue to rise. In the next slide, you'll see housing production has not kept pace. Uh, yep, it's since 2014, a little more than a thousand housing units got built in the community board district. Only 10% of those were affordable. That's 108 units. For a little context, our one project alone would represent a more than 30% increase of all the affordable units built in this district over the last six years. Clearly, the housing crisis is a pervasive issue. Uh, next slide, please. Which is not going to be solved by just one project. Uh, that's why the Fifth Avenue Committee proposed a number of recommendations to tackle it, uh, ranging from preserving the existing housing stock in the neighborhood to building 100% affordable housing on government owned land to, um, where our project fits in, which is captured by point three here, uh, if you can go to the next slide, one of the most ex expedient ways to start bridging the gap of affordable housing available is to encourage the private sector to build. And there's already that mechanism in place through the city's mandatory inclusionary housing program. Again, without any city subsidy required, we can bring about 35 permanently affordable apartments online, to start tackling the housing crisis. And all we need to move forward on this is a rezoning of the block on which this uh, site sits. Um, I'm going to turn it over shortly to my partner, Tucker, to go into more details on the project. But I would ask if uh, Jay Marcus is here from Fifth Avenue Committee, if he has anything else he wants to add on the on the Fifth Avenue Committee study. Um, I'm not sure if Jay is here, and maybe we'll just go on to Tucker to talk through the details of the project. Thanks, Vivian. Next slide, oh. please. Oh. I'm sorry, I couldn't uh, mute um, before they just turned on uh, the unmute. So, um, yes, I know uh, FACT is, is excited, as Vivian pointed out, it very much addresses a housing need that we identified in our report 
we think several strategies are needed to address the housing need. Um, and given the shortage of land available in Sunset Park, uh, what we can get in inclusionary zoning, particularly in appropriate sites like this, uh, that we do feel is very appropriate. And I'll be speaking a little later on the marketing aspects of our involvement. Thanks, Jay. Next slide, please. Um, and I can talk through some of the technical aspects of the um, zoning here. Um, you know, the reason that we were uh, really drawn to this project initially was the really contextual approach that the uh, the rezoning uh, framework would follow. Uh, here is the um, kind of zoning map of this area of Brooklyn. You'll see directly to the north of our site is a uh, gray bar that stretches north along 4th Avenue, which is an R8A uh, zoning district that terminates one block to the north of our site. Next slide, please. And the land use action here actually calls for the extension of that zoning district, just one block face to pick up these two sites uh, to allow for an upzoning to R8A that would allow us to create approximately 135 units of housing on uh, site one here. It's on top of the um, R train station at 25th Street in Sunset Park. Next slide, please. Uh, we spent a lot of time, Vivian mentioned, over the last year and a half, kind of really working through a contextual approach to the development, really understanding, you know, the height of buildings along 4th Avenue and making sure that we were not going to violate any of the height precedents that had been sent, set in the area. You know, we heard from community members, please don't be higher than the church steeple across the street. So we really worked hard to kind of keep the height of the building, as you see in the kind of lower um, schematic drawings here of, of the height, really not violating the height of the church across the street or uh, the historic uh, Greenwood Cemetery entrance. If you go to the next slide, you can really see that in uh, relief from, down from the waterfront up, up to uh, Greenwood as well, and really see that the site kind of nestles nicely in the, uh, the height of the surrounding buildings. Next slide, please. Um, you know, we also heard a number of people in the neighborhood over the last two years or so you know, concerned about the view corridor from the Minerva statue out into Lady Liberty in New York Harbor. And so, you know, did a lot of um, uh, um, sightline studies to make sure that our building would not violate that historic view corridor, both from Minerva in Greenwood Cemetery. And next slide, please. Also from Sunset Park proper, where there's the really cherished view of lower Manhattan um, from Sunset Park. And, um, you know, both in both instances, our building is is, uh, you know, um, behind this tree line. So we should not in interfere with any views there. So um, the rationale, the urban planning rationale for why extending the RIA district is really a response to the housing crisis in the neighborhood, transit oriented development. And that will be taking a parking lot, which is a very rare thing to find in New York City on top of a, tra a train station and turning it into housing. And that it's a contextual response. We're not asking for a new zoning district here or any change uh, in the existing zoning regime for the neighborhood other than the extension of that existing R8A overlay one block face. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so uh, we'll end up with about 108,000 square feet of development rights here. Um, the ground floor retail uh, uh, of which on top there will be approximately 134 dwelling units, 25% of which or, or approximately 35 would be permanently affordable. Uh, we are providing parking on site in the subterranean level, uh, approximately 52 cars were required by the zoning to provide approximately 43. And we heard from community uh, feedback that uh, uh, some additional spaces for things like ride share, bike parking, et cetera, would be preferable for the neighborhood. And so we're able to provide some additional parking there as well, though, though limited um, to reflect the transit oriented development uh, nature of the building itself. And finally, next slide. Um, we've also made commitments on uh, uh, community oriented retail. So really carving up what is actually a fairly small uh, retail footprint here. Um, but making sure that it's um, carved up in small spaces for neighborhood entrepreneurs, small business owners, uh, no big box retail, but instead really kind of catering to the retail characteristics of the neighborhood as it stands today, and a commitment to transparency and retail um, um, accessibility on the on the ground floor, of which a lot of buildings to the north on Fourth Avenue do not have. Um, so we're 
excited about kind of knitting together the neighborhood fabric here from the subway station into the interior of the neighborhood. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Liz Canella to talk through the um, affordable housing component of the building. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name's Liz. I am born and raised in Brooklyn, grew up between Sunset and Fort Greene. Um, and one of the one of the questions that we've gotten the most is uh, what is affordable? Uh, what do we mean by affordable housing? Um, and so if you can go to the next slide. So rents and for the affordable housing in this building, right? So the market rate allows us to build these affordable units. Uh, rents and qualifications are based on what the government calls area median income or AMI. Uh, and this building the, uh, targets what's deemed very low income um, and low income. So any anywhere between 30 and 60% of AMI. Uh, something that we've heard from the community a number of times is that 60% uh, of AMI has not, um, doesn't necessarily, doesn't meet the need of, of specific households in Sunset Park. Um, and again, I'm, in there uh, since the 70s or so. Um, and so a lot of what we're doing is trying to target an average below 60% of AMI. Um, and so what does that mean? Uh, if you go to the next slide, is households making anywhere from $25,000 to up, up to about 60 plus thousand dollars um, can make can qualify for the apartments and then they would pay these specific rents depending on how much they make. The, the goal is for families not to be rent burdened and make about 30% or pay about 30% of their income. Um, next slide. So we know that, I mean, housing is super, is critical and super important, but we know that community benefits shouldn't stop and end just by giving up apartments. So we've worked with, um, we've heard the desire and want to make sure that we are hiring locally, that we are giving the contractors that are from Brooklyn a chance to, to participate in a real way. Um, and obviously having an active ground floor, which Tucker just spoke to. Um, so in order for us to do that, we've, we've, we've really tried to partner with uh, with nonprofits and community organizations on the ground that know know these issues in and out and can reach folks um, specifically on the affordable housing, not just providing the units, but making sure that people in Sunset and in Brooklyn are 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 prepared for the lottery, know that it's happening. Um, so for that, we partner. You can go to the next slide. We've partnered with a few uh, uh, community partners, um, Fifth Avenue Committee and Crescent and BWI on local hiring. Um, and so you'll hear from them in a second. And then 32BJ. So 32BJ is going to, this is going to be a union operated building. We're really proud of, for, with that. We're really proud of that partnership. Um, we wanted to make sure that the jobs that are created, the permanent jobs that are created are career um, focused jobs that, uh, allow for more opportunity than the site is providing now. And next slide, I'm going to kick it off over to Jay to speak a little bit more on Fifth Avenue Committee's role. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, so we're excited to, um, to be the administrative and marketing agent for this. Um, that means that we'll be working with CB7 and other Local uh, local organizations and uh, local electeds, including the borough president's office, to set up sessions first to train people on how to get into the lottery uh, via Housing Connect 2.0, um, how they log in, and we'll also be doing some financial literacy sessions as well in advance. Um, we've done that already. We did very early ones for our our projects in Sunset Park. And we got high attendance on both, so we know there's high demand for learning more about how to access affordable housing. As uh, Tucker and Elizabeth um, pointed out earlier, this really has not been very much affordable housing built in Sunset Park recently. 
So when something like this comes along, there will be high demand. It will be multilingual. Uh, we did do our sessions generally in Spanish um, and Chinese. And uh, when there is demand for Arabic, Arabic as well. So we do want to start, we'll look, be looking forward to starting soon on helping to familiarize people with Housing Connect, begin financial literacy, and then about seven months before the building is scheduled to open, we'll also then be doing the actual marketing uh, to encourage people from Community Board 7 to um, apply. There's a 50% Community Board preference for these units. Um, that goes first before the general population. So we definitely want to make sure a lot of people apply from CB7 so we can make sure we're using up not just that 50%, but hopefully also a high percentage of the people who apply in general population will be eligible as well. So next slide, thanks Jay. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Uh, so equally as important, right, is what are the job opportunities and contracting opportunities for construction? So before the building um, has people living in it, um, and for that, we this project we've really focused on working with Crescent Consulting and BWI to to help develop a local hiring program um, that that plans and starts well well before the the construction and a contracting program that really targets uh, local and diverse businesses uh, in in Brooklyn and again diverse businesses sort of throughout underrepresented. I'm going to kick it off to Crescent uh, to to speak a little bit more on their role in the project. Thank you, Liz. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be involved in such a fantastic project and with a group of developers. I know that are very committed to ensuring that there is an opportunity for both minority and women owned businesses of New York City and Brooklyn, as well as local residents to be employed and work in many facets of this project. As you will see, we are prepared, like everyone else you heard speaking earlier, to work very closely with the Community Board 7, with the Borough President's Office, and many of the different community organizations surrounding this particular uh, project in the Sunset Park area. We will make sure and ensure that all of the contractors and all of the trades that are available for opportunities contractors will have a great presence to bid on all for all these opportunities on the projects. And Crescent will work very closely with the BWI organization, who you will hear from um, after I speak. But we work very closely together, and we will make sure that all of the contractors that are working on this project have and will provide employment opportunities for many of the young folks that are in this community. We will work out um, to make sure that we identify all the great opportunities that we know. We're also gonna be working with um, 32BJ to ensure that local residents are gonna get opportunities with that particular group for the employment opportunities that are available there. I look forward to working with everyone and uh, continuing this initiative and this effort for this project. Thank you, Roman. Um, can we go over to the next slide, please? So, and this is sort of a, a general assessment of some of the jobs that will be available on site. Um, we're pretty early in the process, so we still are going to be developing what the local hiring program will look like. But uh, just to give you a snapshot, any any given day, um, there would be anywhere from about, about 100 to 150 construction workers on site. Um, over the course of a two year construction period and we've partnered uh, with BWI so we can go to the next slide. To uh, really make sure that the folks in sunset and in Brooklyn on the ground um, have access to to these uh, career focused jobs with that. I'm going to kick it over to Aaron to speak to his role. Thanks, Liz. Uh, my name is Aaron Schiffman. I'm the founding executive director of Brooklyn Workforce Innovations. We're a nonprofit workforce development organization 
Our mission is simply to help uh, low and moderate income people gain uh, access to skills uh, and living wage employment opportunities and career paths. Since 2000, we've connected uh, almost 11,000 low income New Yorkers, mostly Brooklynites, to, to careers, uh, upwardly mobile family supporting careers. We have about eight skills based training programs now, and we will serve even during the pandemic about 850 new trainees each year. For the last five years, we've been working uh, on developing customized training and local recruitment initiatives uh, to ensure that low income New Yorkers and Brooklynites have access to training, employment and careers that are associated with local economic development and real estate projects like this totem project on 4th Avenue. We've been very impressed with totems commitment to engage BWI Crescent Consultants and others early on in their planning process for the site. And we're excited about the workforce potential, both with construction and permanent jobs. Uh, I applaud Totem's early commitment to work with 32 BJ on the property management jobs. And we're hopeful that we'll be able to connect Sunset Park residents to the construction related positions that were on a couple of slides earlier um, that the project's gonna bring to the community. Um, I am very excited about the dedication of resources that Totem is putting forward on this project to ensure that local Sunset Park residents, including young adults, have access to the employment opportunities. And we stand ready to work with Totem to make sure the local residents are in fact hired. We have a strong track record um, in the Sunset Park community. We also have a strong uh, history of partnership and collaboration with Crescent Consultant. We worked on a few different projects um, out at the Brooklyn Navy Yard that led to local hiring and a high level of MWBE um, firms being engaged and helping with those firms hire from the communities around uh, the Navy Yard. We have every confidence we'll be able to do that again in Sunset Park if given the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Um, if we can go to the next slide, we're going to try to get through the rest of them. Uh, so I do want to, I, I now want to kick it off to uh, third principal of Totem, um, Manuel Mancia, to speak a little bit more on the the building, the building and, and what it looks like. Thank you, Liz, and hello, everyone. Um, as far as the materiality and the design of the building, I want to refer to a little bit about our philosophy from a design standpoint. So our designs, and this is not true, uh, to this project only for our projects in general is we usually make all of our decisions based on what's best for the community and the context or the surrounding of the building, uh, making sure that that uh, the building is not alienating in any way that it has a human scale and a human face to it with enough vegetation and permeability towards the street and its surroundings. Next slide, please. So as you can see here, for example, you know, and we're still in the design development phase, but you know, some of the uh, materials that we're exploring here, like the terracotta facade, you know, to pay homage to some of the surroundings, contextual and historical uh, aspects of the community and the neighborhood. Uh, next slide, please. And also from a sustainability standpoint, you know, we have a big commitment uh, when it comes to sustainability and making sure that green infrastructure is incorporated and in, in, uh, bringing some of these amenities both to the site and the building and to its uh, context around it, such as green roof when it comes to the building itself and bios wells when it comes to the surroundings. This is something that we've heard throughout uh, some of the engagements that come directly from community feedback, but also you know some of the objectives that we know the borough president's office has. Um, one of the uh, amenities uh, that we're excited about in this case is uh, uh, UNI, which is a bike parking pod that we have the founder and CEO of the company, you know, talk briefly about uh, in the next slide. I'm going to take over here. Just apologies to everyone that apparently we're going too long. So let me just move on quickly. You know, we could talk. Many of people have heard in the past about bike parking on site. We're committed to removing number of parking spaces to provide structured bike parking uh, as a transit oriented development amenity. Next slide. Um, and then just 1 final piece of, of um, you know, community um, oriented feedback. We've been approached by the MTA about pri providing a um, 
an easement uh, on our site at, at our own cost uh, to provide for a future elevator in the development. Um, so we have committed to providing that easement to the MTA through a deed uh, a, that would be executed simultaneous to the rezoning. And uh, I'm going to pause there and um, uh, conclude our presentation. Tanya, are you there to take it over? Yes, I'm sorry. I was unable to unmute. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I just wanted to go back, I guess, to Elizabeth. You did have, you shared the screen with the breakdown of the um, affordable housing units. I didn't see um, a breakdown of the income. I know you mentioned the income. Do you have another slide for that? Or if you could just talk about that more? Yeah, so the income qualifications specifically. Okay. Uh, so just for for future reference, I know it's no longer up there. Um, it, I think it's it's slide 18. Um, so the building is going to have uh, between is go going to have one, two, three bedrooms. It's not going to have studio. So essentially, it's going to anyone with a family of one to about six people can qualify. And the 30, 30 to 50, 30 to 60 percent of AMI means essentially, I mean, I won't go through each one, but so for a family of one, um, anyone making from 23,000 to about 40,000 would qualify for a unit um, making varying income ranges, I mean, paying varying rents starting at $503. And then so for a family of four, uh, a family of four uh, making a combined income of 34,000 to about 60,000 would qualify for apartments anywhere starting from, so a family of four would be a two bedroom, uh, anywhere start, starting from $598. So, so not to make anyone's like ears bleed, I, I won't go through every single income band, but it is, it, it's up here. So essentially anything uh, box off in pink um, is 30 to 60 percent of AMI would would qualify for for the units. Okay, good. Thank you. No yeah, and I just want to clarify: it's not the entire range of income within each uh, band. It'll be a couple of thousand dollars. So within that large band you have, yes. there are many incomes that would not qu qualify. Yes. Yes. So Denise, I'm not sure if Denise is she's handling the translation. I'm not sure who's doing that. I'm here. I'm okay. here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you want me to translate that set that last portion that, that Liz mentioned? Or the question, because I did ask about the rents, but yeah. Oh, I can translate the question. Okay. Let me say the question first. Con respecto a las unidades de vivienda asequibles previstas, ¿cuál es el rango de ingreso que califican? Para los hogares prospectivos, según el tamaño de hogar, ¿cuáles son los alquileres previstos en función del número de dormitorio y cuál es la distribución de unidades por tamaño de dormitorio? Um, en, el, en la presentación que Elizabeth Canelo ha presentado, ello hay un ingreso que es más disponible para la gente que vive ahí, en el lugar. Y esta proporción va a estar disponible para que todo el mundo lo pueda ver y revisar. Si tienen preguntas, por favor, mándalo en el mensaje y le podemos mandar más seguro lo que Elizabeth Canelo dijo sobre esto, estos ingresos, lo que califican para estos ingresos. Gracias. Thank you, Denise. Mm -hmm. uh, so the next question, um, and I know you touched on some of this, uh, what consideration has been given to in setting aside a portion of the represented commercial ground floor and or space for the MTA um, access easement as affordable long term and or interim space for possibly uh, arts or cultural institutions, as well as local retail and small businesses? 
Thank you, Tanya. I take that. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, the 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 easement space. We're we're very open to a conversation Wait, about. Uh, Tucker, hold off. Can you have that uh, allow for the Spanish translation before you respond to the questions? Was that your question number two, Tanya? It's three. It's three. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Tal estrategia de marketing comenzaría con una campaña de afebitación financiera para ayudar a los residentes del área a ser elegible para la lotería. And let me, let me give you another portion. ¿Qué consideración se ha dado al determinar una parte de la planta bajo, baja comercial representada y o el espacio para el acceso de la MTA como espacio asequible a largo plazo o provisional para usos artísticos y culturales, así como al por menos local y pequeño empresas. Go ahead, Tucker. Thank you. Um, yes, so uh, the, the easement space, uh, which will be eventually deeded over to the MTA as a, as a great candidate for some sort of uh, temporary either Art installation or a nonprofit space. It's something that we're open to. We're also interested in potentially engaging with local arts groups about public art um, on the side of the building uh, to the extent that that's possible as well. So it's a it's a conversation that we're very open to. Yes. Let me, let me translate that, that response. Lo que el señor Tucker respondió es que ellos están hablando con grupos locales que son artistas que puedan dar su, su pinturas o cualquier cosa de altura que ellos quieren poner, artículos que quieran poner en público para que pueda, pueda participar en esta estrategia. So, si ustedes tienen un grupo local que quiera ser parte de este, este proyecto, por favor, déjanos saber en el email. Gracias. Thank you, Denise. Um, so the next question deals with um, sustainable and renewable energy, which is very important to the borough president. If you can talk about um, what practices you've used to promote um, stormwater runoff would be my first first question, and I'll, I'll go to the second part. Let me just translate that, Tucker. Okay. Es una política del presidente Adams promover el uso de recursos de energía sostenible y renovable enfocados en avanzar un futuro sostenible en Brooklyn. También es la política del presidente Adams promover prácticas para retener el escurrido de aguas de tormenta. All yours, Tucker. Thank you. Um, yes, with regard to stormwater management and bioswales and, um, and and even green roofs to help with stormwater retention, uh, it's something that we're already planning uh, in the project. We've we've heard it uh, loud and clear from the neighborhood that priorities around sustainability are important. We've also been investigating uh, even beyond the bioswale question, which would require some MTA approval. But the idea of potentially removing a, a parking space in the cellar level and replacing it with a retention tank so that we could comply with city effluent limits, but also alleviate stormwater runoff in the area, which has been a chronic problem, particularly on the corner of 4th Avenue and 24th Street. Um, so it's something that we're excited about bringing to the neighborhood. And so the next portion deals with, you know, I guess, partnering with other city agencies or, or with the State Department of Environmental Protection or NYSERDA in terms of incorporating the green roof um, coverings or DEP rain gardens. Has there been any, any consideration there? Denise? <laughs> give, give me one second. ¿Qué consideración se ha dado posiblemente en cooperación con el Departamento de Protección Ambiental, la Oficina Sostenible del Alcalde, y la incorporación de diseño de casa pasivo cubierta de techo azul o verde, cubiertas de vientos y obras jardines. So, um, yes, we are planning a green roof uh, on the top of the building as, as well as on the terraces of, of, the, of, the, of the building. Um, 
We're also planning to go for LEED certification on this building, what would be one of the first LEED certified buildings in Sunset Park. Let me translate that real quickly. Si, ellos tienen planes de, de inculcar un techo verde. También están, van a ser primer edificio que es LEED certified, que significa que todo va a ser a grado um, de energía sostenible. Thank you, Denise. I think that concludes my questions. Um, okay. For those speaking Spanish, you will be given additional time for, you, for our translators to take turns with your immediate translation. Please pause after each comment to allow your remarks, remarks to be stated in English. Para los que hablan español, se le dará tiempo adicional para que nuestros traductores tengan turnos con usted para una traducción inmediata. Hagan una pausa después de cada comentario para que sus observaciones sean en inglés. Gracias. We remind viewers that if you wish to testify, you must use the message in the WebEx chat and indicate your intent to speak. After the presentation and question and answer portion, we will call speakers in order of the chat request. This is Ina's turn. I think there's a translation for you. Page 20 bottom. Yeah, at the bottom. Can we just allow people to testify and whoever's doing Spanish then give me some lead time to look at the question? Please. Sure. That's fine. Thank you. So, Ina, I'll turn it over to you. All right. We have a comprehensive list of speakers, beginning with Maria Roca. Denise, do you need to translate? Can you hear me now? Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, good evening. Uh, I am Maria Roca. I've um, been a um, 66 year resident of uh, Sunset Park um, and founder of Friends of Sunset Park. 737 Fourth Avenue is a highly speculative project that we, the public, is being drawn into without any guarantees. Again, all we hear is trust us. Where are the financials, the performance, the lenders guarantees, the highly speculative nature of all this? Mr. Reed testified to at last week's CB7 meeting when he said he has had to borrow from family and friends to pull money together. We're looking at smoke and mirrors, no rezoning. This is a game and we are the pawns. We, the working class community, CB7, elected officials, nonprofit community organizations in need of donations. Again, a speculative profit making, profit making, excuse me, on the backs of working class and essential workers. Approve the rezoning and this property can be flipped for huge profits since it is in a federally opportunity zone in a New York minute. Point number two. As evidenced by the first black and white picture on Totem's website, which looks like it was taken from the high point at Greenwood, uh, Greenwood Cemetery, the goal is to capture, in other words, hijack the iconic view 
from the cemetery to New York Bay for private property profit. Why they want to build why they want to build a 14 story building, the only such oversized building south of Prospect Expressway. That view has always belonged to everyone who visits Greenwood Cemetery, a national historic landmark. The view contributed to that designation. Ask Minerva and Lady Liberty if that's not true. It's unfathomable that anyone would vote in favor of such a highly speculative project that threatens the integrity of a national historic line by hijacking its view corridor. It is a totally inappropriate development. It is, there are no guarantees. There is no thing for the community other than, and trust me, these are nobody that earns 30% of 40% or 50% of AMI, which is highly inappropriate for Sunset Park to begin with, is going to benefit from this. So thank you for listening and please think about this very carefully and, and look at the numbers, please. I asked uh, uh, Board President um, Adams, I, I know he has a staff of very um, uh, intelligent and uh, knowledgeable people. Look at the numbers. As for those, um, um, the data, as for the financial, as for, because therein lies the truth about this project. Good evening and thank you very much. Okay, our next speaker is Sadia Khalid. And we ask that all speakers indicate whether they want their remarks translated into Spanish before they begin their testimony. Hi, thank you so much. Um, are you able to hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of Brooklyn and have lived just up the block from the proposed rezoning for 35 years. The real question that's on my mind with regards to this proposal is, is this really all we deserve? And my answer is, this rezoning is not a response to the need for affordable housing in Sunset Park, which is a very real issue. We all agree on that. This rezoning, however, is a way to make a private developer an enormous profit with a few affordable apartments thrown in to pacify the community and convince us to approve this rezoning. The private developer Totem stands to gain so much from this rezoning, despite their repeated claim that their plan is to the benefit of the community. They purchased commercial land for a fraction of what it would have cost if it were already zoned for residential use to their benefit. They're asking for a rezoning so they can build a 14 story luxury high rise that is completely out of context in our low rise neighborhood to their benefit. They're offering only 25% quote unquote affordable units and their 75% unaffordable units to their benefit. The residents of Sunset Park deserve a deal that's designed for our benefit. If we're being asked to offer our neighborhood up to a developer, we should be given something meaningful in return. This is simply not enough. There are some who have argued that something is better than nothing and that at least 35 families will have housing if the totem plan moves ahead. And as a public school teacher, I care deeply and personally for New York City families. And it's precisely because I care for families so deeply that I urge Borough President Adams and Assemblyperson Menchaca to say no to this bad plan because we can't divorce an event from its outcomes. We can't put this one project in a vacuum and disconnect it from the far reaching effects it will have on all of the families in our community beyond those 35. The families, the heart of this community who will be displaced by rising rents and an influx of gentrifiers and circling developers looking for their own rezoning deals. This issue is not an issue of something versus nothing. This issue is about the future of Sunset Park. And so I want to say our community should not be sold so cheaply. I want to say, please, Borough President Adams, please, Assemblyperson Menchaca, and all those who are meant to speak on our behalf, look to the future. Totem is making an incredible, incredibly profitable investment in its own financial future in this project. But we need projects and developments that are an authentic investment in this community. We need housing solutions that offer long-term benefits to our community, not short-term gain for developer. We need those who speak for us, who represent us, for elected officials whom we voted for and plan to vote for to invest in our futures. You have the power, Bor Borough President Adams and Assemblyperson Menchaca, to set the standard for what the residents of our community of Sunset Park deserve. It's now in your hands to decide if we deserve a bad deal or if we deserve more. 
If we deserve to continue to be crowded out in the shadows of towers of glass and masonry that we have to beg for access to, or if we get more, please say no to this bad plan. Please hold developers accountable to the communities they seek to transform. Please be our voice and require developers to come to the table with plans that reflect the tremendous value of our community. We deserve that. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, our next speaker is G.E. Peng. G uh, Ina, could you spell that? Yes, yeah. J-I-H-E-P-E-N-G. It looks like GE is trying to unmute. Hear me? Hello? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Great. Hi, my name is Julie Peng and I'm a resident of Sunset Park. Um, one of the things that I find truly wonderful and unique about this neighborhood is its commitment to community. Uh, Sunset Park is first and foremost an immigrant and working class neighborhood populated by the very people that make it possible for us to survive in the dire circumstances that we currently face during this pandemic. What luxury housing would do for this community is to push out local residents, continuing the devastating movement of gentrification in Brooklyn. What developers and the city are essentially saying in this instance is that the humanity of immigrants in the working class matters less to them than excessive profit that the very people that make this city are less important to them than wealthy transplants. Jane Jacobs, who's or, who organized to preserve Washington Square Park when corporate interests wanted to insert a highway in its place, famously said that cities have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they are created by everybody. What is being proposed today is not a creation of the community, it is quite the opposite in fact. I strongly oppose the proposal to bring luxury housing into this neighborhood, and I hope the board will consider this feedback from my neighbors and myself. I yield my time. All right, our next speaker is Elise Shook. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay, hold on one second. Thank you so much. Um, At least your time is ticking. Your time is ticking. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, my name is Elise Shook. I'm a resident of South Park Slope. I have lived in Brooklyn for the past 18 years and have lived on um, 22nd Street, just 10 minutes from the proposed new building on 737 Fourth Avenue since 2008. Tonight, I urge Eric Adams to be courageous and to stand up for working class families in Sunset Park by voting no against the 737 Fourth Avenue development. The real estate developer developer Totem has promised to do only the bare minimum regarding creating affordable units for local residents. In truth, 75% of the apartments in the 737 4th Avenue application will be unaffordable to working class families in Sunset Park. The decision about the 737 4th Avenue residential application before the borough president tonight has far greater implications for the Sunset Park community beyond creation of a few apartments that the developer has slated as affordable for CB7 residents. Mr. Adams, in actuality, if you approve this application, you are willingly choosing to displace working class residents of Sunset Park. I implore you to consider the, the reality of displacement, which inevitably occurs once the Department of City, City Planning approves rezoning applications. Fourth Avenue has already been transformed across the past 12 years and real estate developers are continuing to build 
at a furious pace throughout the city. It is, it is relentless. The real issue here is the fact that Mayor de Blasio's MIH program is fundamentally flawed and broken, benefits, benefits real estate developers, not community residents, and has led to massive displacement in New York City. I understand that both Eric Adams and Carlos Menchaca have launched campaigns to replace Mayor de Blasio. The time is now to create a more equitable and just housing policy for New York City, a housing policy that is truly affordable for New York City residents, a policy that will protect the diversity and, crea and creativity of the city. I strongly encourage both Eric Adams and Carlos Menchaca to champion working class families, work to revamp the broken MIH program, and create a fair housing policy that all New Yorkers desperately deserve. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Okay, our next speaker is Jorge Lima Rodriguez. Hi, my name is Jorge. I grew up in Sunset Park and live here now. I have family and friends in the neighborhood who are immigrants, low-income people, and some are undocumented. I also work at a nonprofit law firm that provides free legal, civil legal services to low-income people, many of whom live in Sunset Park. I oppose the 4th Avenue rezoning for many reasons. First, because this project threatens to gentrify our neighborhood and displace the brown working class immigrant community that, li that lives here. At Community Board 7's last hearing, several members of the board argued that something is better than nothing, that 35 quote unquote affordable units is better than nothing. But if we take a moment to analyze what that something really is, we realize that it's not better, but it's actually worse. First, out of the 35 supposed affordable units, only 17 are guaranteed for residents of Community Board 7. And none of them are truly guaranteed for people of, of Sunset Park. Because Community Board 7 also includes the neighborhood of Windsor Terrace. And we also need to account for the labor that it takes to actually apply for a lottery and hope that you are, are selected for that. A measly 17 units is also not enough for a community that is severely rent burdened that is behind on rent because our government has failed to provide real relief for non-citizens and especially undocumented people and a community that has significantly lost income due to the COVID-19 pandemic. There are hundreds, thousands of people in our community who need affordable housing and 17 units are simply not enough. With these 17 units will also come 100 unaffordable units, 100 unaffordable apartments that will make it so that higher income people come into our neighborhood, which will inevitably attract more expensive businesses and will inevitably raise the cost of living in this neighborhood and kick people out, kick the people, kick the people of Sunset Park out of their neighborhood, people like members of my family, people like my friends and people like the clients that I serve and my job. I am a massive stakeholder in this project. How you, Borough President Adams and Council Member Manchaka vote directly impacts my life and the lives of the people that I love. But this project and this vote is also high stakes for the both of you. How you vote will determine how the people will view your candidacy for mayor. The people today and every day moving forward will, will watch how you vote, will watch how you treat our community, and will and will watch whose interests you keep in mind. We will, we will watch as to whether you keep the interests of rich, greedy, for-profit developers or whether you actually fight for the people who have the power to vote you into office, but also out of office and the people who you vowed to serve. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Joseph Lara. And a quick reminder to speakers to indicate whether or not you will need Spanish translation. Thank you.
Joseph seems to be having technical issues. All right, our next speaker after Joseph is Annie Abreu. And again, for technical issues, if people are able to get on with the phone at some point tonight, that's also acceptable. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we hear oh, you. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Anya Brew. I've been a resident of Sunset Park since I was born. I'm 22 now. Um, and I think that the one thing that seems to be ignored when talking about affordable housing is access to affordable housing. This is the issue that me and my mother have dealt with for the past seven years during the most defining years of my life where I've had to go through the last years of high school and the last years of college. Um, and we've shared in a, a room in a shared apartment for the past seven years, and I've sent more than 64 applications to the affordable housing lottery that have all been denied. And we aren't eligible for regular apartments from private landlords because there are currently income requirements in place that are quite frankly discriminatory towards low income residents and keep us from actually being able to access these affordable housing apartments. This has been the case when we are both working and this is and we have like a combined income of 26,000 and even more so now that I'm out of work and I'll be starting law school in the fall and have been advised against working throughout my first year. So despite not fulfilling these income requirements, we could very well afford rent, but income requirements block access. And when you take into consideration that New York City AMI went up this year, income requirements are going to be even higher for two person families like my mother and me. So even if there are 25% affordable housing apartments available in this development, they're not going to be accessible to the low income residents that already live in the neighborhood. They're only going to bring more affluent people. And let's be real, it's mainly going to be white people because they accumulate the majority of wealth in this country. And it's going to continue the process of gentrification. There's two more affordable housing buildings being built in Sunset Park. And instead of looking at them and going, finally, housing for the people who need it, me and my mother will finally have a home. I fear for the future of Sunset Park because all I see is government sponsored gentrification and the further displacement of the low income residents who built the neighborhood on their backs. The fact that city, the city's housing crisis is so dire that somebody may, that makes 75K a year is able to be considered for these affordable housing apartments, but somebody that makes less than 26,000 isn't is ridiculous because that, that leaves a large majority of low income residents in New York City without access to adequate housing, which forces them to live in unsafe or overcrowded situations like my own or to be displaced. This is not for me. This is not for my neighbors. Stop acting like it is. It's not for us. I have faith that Eric Adams, who back in January spoke out against gentrification in a way that spoke to me when he said, new arrivals are hijacking apartments from longtime residents and struck a chord with the mayor who has stood by and let it happen. And that Carlos Menchaca, who stood with Sunset Park residents against the industry city rezoning will say no to this development. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jeremy Kaplan. Hello? Yes, you're unmuted. Hello. Hello. Jeremy, we hear you, Jeremy. Just speak. We hear you. You just muted yourself, Jeremy. Unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. You just unmuted, you muted yourself. Jeremy, we hear you. Please speak.
Jeremy, we hear you. Please speak. Hello, I'm not sure if I'm being heard right now. We hear you. <laughs> Jeremy, are you hearing us? So you can hear me right now? Sorry, I can't hear anybody, but I'll, I'll keep on going. Yes. I'm sorry, I have no idea oh. that for some reason the audio is off. But anyways, I'm equivocally opposed to this rezoning. Uh, sorry about the technical issues. Um, it's crazy to me in the middle of COVID and the situation that we're dealing with right now with the housing crisis and the way in which this proposal is presented where it's seen as a panacea when clearly it's not. Um, you know, housing that 75% market rate is gonna create more displacement. And I, I'm just, we're not gonna take this as just the developer doing the most when it's actually the bare minimum that the developer is doing. And we need to see that for what it is, is that we're taking the bare minimum of MIH and we're already acknowledged that MIH and that several people like Carlos Menchaca and Eric Adams who are running for mayor have acknowledged that there are issues and flaws with this program. And our developer right now that Totem is taking this bare minimum and you know, saying that this is the most that they can do when it's, when it's basically unacceptable right now. Um, you know, in a deep housing crisis right now, what we need to be doing is building 100% affordable housing and not relying on developers to, to build housing for us. And especially to have them abuse, you know, zoning issues by having them be able to push over, take space that is not zoned for housing, be able to take advantage of this loophole and build this, you know, luxury housing. Um, so the fact is that we're getting the bare minimum from people. And uh, it's sort of a slap in the face in the midst of COVID, and especially to see a developer or you know nonprofit organizations sort of promote this as if it's the best that we can get out of this project. Um, when frankly, I think Fifth Avenue Committee should be promoting this as a 100% affordable housing and should be doing more. And they should be going and and saying what can we do to get more out of this when. You know, this is uh, land that is not zoned for housing. And if we have a real affordability crisis, you know, adding 100 mix or 100 market rate units is going to increase that crisis, increase it like crazy. And, you know, it will just add more to the displacement. And we've already seen studies out about MIH rezoning so far, whether it's in East New York, uh, where the displacement levels are much, much higher then what we're filling in with a small percentage of 25% or 20% of, you know, quote, affordable housing. Um, so we really have to look at the economics of getting 100% market rate and the displacement that that will cause versus literally getting maybe 17 units for people in Sunset Park, which is, is really a drop in the bucket. And, and so we really have to, to say no to this proposal. We have to, like Eric Adams himself says on his website, take really aggressive affordable housing stances. I don't consider this an aggressive affordable housing stance. This is the bare minimum, so we must vote no to this. Carlos Menchaca must vote no to this proposal. And uh, that's, that's all I have to say. Okay, so we're gonna start announcing the next uh, three speakers, so uh, you have time to prepare. But first, we're going to go back to Joseph Lara and try to get his testimony. Joseph, I, we see that you may be having microphone issues. It's me. Uh, my name's John. Hello, am I speaking? Uh, no, Joseph Lauer. There you go. We see Joseph. We saw Joseph.
Okay, in the meantime, I will announce our next three speakers. Eduardo Rojas, Jorge Muniz Reyes, and Paul Stein. Eduardo, you're unmuted. Cold. There you go. You're, yes, Eduardo, you're unmuted. All right. Cool. I just kept on uh, switching on and off. I think I was still waiting for Joseph, but he didn't show up, right? All right. So uh, my name is uh, Eduardo Rojas, uh, Sunset Park resident here in opposition of 737 uh, rezoning proposal. Uh, Sunset Park has always understood the importance of community because through community, marginalized individuals are able to exercise their power in numbers. From block parties to quinceañeras, our community approaches everything as a giant pot luck because we know that through equitable contributions, we are able to have a much bountiful feast despite our economic disadvantages. To quote Alan Dubutan, author of The Architecture of Happiness, it is in dialogue with pain that beautiful things acquire their value. Sunset Park is nothing short of a beautiful community and that includes the alleged deprecating Dunkin' Donuts that Totem uh, will replace in favor of a luxury building because that particular Dunkin' Donut has inadvertently provided Sunset Park a space for community members to organize in hope of a better future through dialogues of pain. Tucker Reed has conveniently challenged Sunset Park to find any other rezoning proposal that has been as comprehensive and inclusive as Totem's. But before the community can offer an answer, Mr. Reed insists on championing Totem as the only viable solution to Sunset Park housing crisis while simultaneously pointing a finger to our failing government housing policies. That's the attitude of an entity that would not accept to be held accountable by a low-income community or any government representative if it fails to fulfill its promises. So with all due respect, Borough President Mr. Adam and Council, Mecha and Council Menchaca, no one knocks at your door and tells you you're not competent to address your household needs and tells you to hand over the keys without getting you upset. So it's important that Sunset Park is given time to answer Mr. Reed's challenge, not under his terms, but ours, by allowing us to demonstrate our power of collective action and turning social capital into community economic gains. It's imperative that Sunset remains an autonomous community capable of solving its own housing crisis without the help of exploitative, for-profit, affordable housing, such as Totem 737 rezoning proposal. In addition, this testimony is also an open call for my fellow community members and potential allies. It is important now than ever to organize and prioritize holistic solutions through personal development in our community over short-term gains by way, by way of for-profit housing developments. Luxury developments by way of affordable housing will always equal low-income community displacement. Thank you. Uh, hashtag protect Sunset Park. Good night. I see that Joseph has his uh, equipment set up again. Okay, can we try Joseph one more time? Hello. We hear you, Joseph. Oh, um, hello, folks. So, um, I come to you as a Sunset Park resident, uh, but also as someone intimately familiar with the challenges our predominantly immigrant working class neighborhood faces. Um, we really have to stop hiding behind these misleading terms like uh, affordable housing. It's just cruel to present these projects as some form of salvation to these neighborhood, to my neighbors, um, when only 17 of these units are set aside for actual Sunset Park residents. Um, for those truly impacted by the housing shortage who can't even qualify for these homes and honestly just face the risk of displacement. Um, in a time of a looming crisis, uh, a looming eviction crisis, uh, which families in Sunset Park will be able to afford any of these affordable units, let alone any of the market units. Real estate is a predatory industry. You know, this system is broken and the metrics used to assess qualifications do not serve are underserved immigrant communities. We need to stop acting as private developers will save us from, house, from the housing crisis. 
out of the goodness of their hearts. I'm not an NIMBY or a YIMBY, but come to you as a local resident deeply concerned about the continuing injustices and trauma faced by our immigrant community who often do not are not represented in these conversations. Because um, if these families do not also need uh, or are entitled to affordable housing or a safe neighborhood for a responsive and accountable government. For President Adams, I know you're running for mayor. So I want to ask, does this project reflect your strategy as a mayor to tackle the housing crisis? Does your vision realistically include working class immigrants who are the backbone of the city? And the same for Council Member Menchaca, also running for mayor. Is this your vision for housing for the city's essential workers? You know, our community is worth a hell of a lot more than you do. So thank you so much for your time. Okay, Jorge Muniz Reyes, followed by Paul Stein and Rodrigo Carmena. Okay, you're unmuted. Ina, can we go to our next one? Yes, uh, we may have gotten the name wrong in this case, but we're going to move on to Paul Stein. Good evening. My partner, Elena Schwalski, and I have been homeowners on 47th Street for almost 15 years now. We are strongly opposed to this application for a rezoning because we think it will have a very harmful effect on the working people of Sunset Park. It is at best inaccurate and at worst very dishonest for the developer to claim that their pitiful small number of affording housing units are going to increase the stock of affordable housing in Sunset Park. The reason for that is that a hundred market rate, call it luxury or just call it market rate, new housing units in Sunset Park will just contribute to the gentrification, which has been ongoing from Industry City and other sources here. And the net effect, when you ask how many housing units are they contributing, the question to ask is what is the net effect of their small number of units? And, and their large number of market rate units and the net effect is that it is going to drive up rentals in, in this neighborhood. And on my own block in 47th Street, I know in the past few years, a number of young people especially, and families that were growing, were forced to move out of the neighborhood because they could not afford an apartment in Sunset Park. And it's just a smokescreen, talking about uh, 17 units for our Community Board 7, and let's say half of those go to Sunset Park and half go to Windsor Terrace, which I should point out has a much higher median income than Sunset Park. It will, it will help a few people, but it will, the overall development will, will hurt dozens and dozens and dozens 
of, of people. And lastly, one of the representatives of, of Tempo said that it sets a precedent for future development. That was a quote. And she was very proud of that. And that's the scariest thing I've heard from the Tempo representatives. That is a precedent we don't need that will price our neighbors and our friends out of this neighborhood. Thank you very much. Hey, uh, let's try Jorge Muniz Reyes again. Hello. You, you have the wrong Jorge. This is Jorge Lama Rodriguez. Uh, one moment. Okay, are you ready to give testimony? Hello? Jorge Lima. I, I, so, I, I already gave testimony. The person you're trying to unmute is Jorge Muñiz Reyes. That's another Jorge. That's not me. You, you unmuted the wrong person. We're having technical issues with uh, Reyes. Okay, I, I already gave testimony. Thank you. No problem. Okay, can we move on to Paul Stein? Uh, we already did Paul Stein. Uh, Rodrigo Carmena is next. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you and see you. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Rodrigo Carmena. I'm a longtime community activist former member of Community Board 7, and we spent the last 15 years working with an immigrant rights organization located on 23rd Street and 5th Avenue, around the corner from the proposed rezoning of 737 4th Avenue. I'm here today to speak in, a, in forceful opposition to the rezoning of 737 4th Avenue, brought forward by the developer Totem Brooklyn. I'm opposed to this project because it represents all that is wrong with our city's affordable housing strategy, and in particular, Mayor de Blasio's failed mandatory inclusionary housing policy, or MIH. Year after year, the MIH program has failed to produce the number of affordable housing units that the mayor has intended. MIH was expected to produce 12,000 units in eight years, and, is, and its four years of existence has produced a little over 2,000 affordable units. These developers aim to use Mayor de Blasio's failed MIH policy to tell the people of Sunset Park that this development will be a win for working families in search of affordable apartments. This is a farce. This, uh, this development is nothing more than a giveaway to the corporate real estate developers, their equity, their private equity backers, and the wealthy tenants who will undoubtedly continue to gentrify our working class community. This project is not affordable housing. It is not intended for the working class residents of this community and it is not what this community needs. What's happening in Sunset Park and across Brooklyn is not rocket science. Working class families, immigrants, communities of color, and small businesses are, are being systematically displaced and erased from the neighborhoods that they help build. And this is no accident. The real estate industry and their lobbying arm, the Real Estate Board of New York, has worked hand in hand with our politicians to weaken tenant protections, empower big real estate through tax incentives, and push more and more New Yorkers into the housing instability and homelessness that we see today. Borough President Adams knows this story full well. His political campaign committees have benefited from donations from big real estate and bundlers like Jed Walentis, a billionaire developer and one of the two principals of Two Trees Management Company. Borough President Adams doesn't care about our testimony. In fact, he's not even here. He knows that he's going to rubber stamp this year load application because that's what his donors expect, nothing less. This development is going to displace neighboring residents. It's going to displace the working class and immigrant families that live in, in, a, live in and around this block. The same families that I've seen displaced year after year in Sunset Park and South Brooklyn. We deserve better. The people of Sunset Park and South Brooklyn deserve better. And New Yorkers aren't going to forget who stood with them during this difficult moment and who sold them out for their advantage. Borough President Adams, Councilmember Menchaca, the people of New York are watching. 
They're, they remember, they're watching you now, and they're gonna take this into consideration when they vote next year. Protect Sunset Park, I yield my time. Okay, can we try unmuting Jorge Mudis Reyes again? Otherwise, our next speakers Richard, are Vanessa Thill, Brittany Espinoza, and Sophia Sutcliffe. Okay, am I next? Yes, Brittany. Oh, this is Vanessa Till speaking. Yes, Vanessa, you are next. Okay, great. Um, Hi, my name is Vanessa Till. I live in Brooklyn. I'm involved in housing organizing. I've spent a lot of time talking to tenants and learning about land use policies. Um, so here we are again. Every week, it seems we have to testify again with the same message. We have to sit through another meeting pleading to keep our homes and livelihoods. I am outraged that the ravenous real estate development machine has not been paused due to COVID. If anything, predatory landlords are accelerating their land grabs while the people of New York suffer through the pandemic without government aid. Borough President Adams, this summer you spoke out about racial justice and your commitment to supporting transformative policies. Well, this is one chance to prove it. How many times do we have to beg our elected officials who are supposed to advocate for us to listen? I would like to ask you, Mr. Borough President and all politicians and candidates on this call, how do you measure the success of a development what is the supposed revitalization that a luxury tower brings to the neighborhood? We are tired of the lies and empty promises. Are you measuring the people who will be forced to leave the area when the surrounding landlords jack up their rents and try to evict them? This is a proven pattern. When groups across the city are coming together to say stop racist rezonings, why don't you listen? We are not saying, saying this, um, we will not stop saying this because this is life or death for us. If you vote yes, you are proving yet again, you are more beholden to real estate lobbyists than to New Yorkers, the New Yorkers you pledge to represent. If you want to be mayor of the people, you know what to do. Protect Sunset Park. Hey, Brittany Espinoza. Followed by Sophia Sutcliffe. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we hear you. Okay. Brittany, I am 15 years old. I am testifying in opposition of the 737 Fourth Avenue luxury building. I am a lifelong resident in Sunset Park. Since my parents came from their country and they established in this community, we have seen drastic changes. My family has been displaced once and it, has, it was an experience that I don't want any family to go through. COVID has struck many families with job loss, rent increase, et cetera. And the only ones who are stuck in the situation, it is time to stop putting Sunset Park on the menu of gentrification and building uh, luxury condos disguised as accessible housing when it's not true. This project will just inject an increase to the rent, and that is conducting more families to live in shelters. Mr. Adams and Mr. Ranchaka, if you really care deep down in your heart that Sunset Park families are being affected by the gentrification that every day is gaining strength, Let's come together as one community and create a project that will be 100% affordable for all the families who are in need. So I will repeat this over and over until it's, it is accomplished. We are not demanding to live for free. We are demanding to live with dignity. Sunset Park no se vende. Have a great day. Sophia Sutcliffe, followed by Whitney Hugh. Hello. 
We're having technical issues with Sophia. Can we move on to Whitney? Sure. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we hear you. Great. Hi, my name is Whitney Hoop and I live on 4th and 20th Street. I have been in the neighborhood for close to a decade and I have seen the direct impacts of the increase of luxury housing has had on my neighbors, especially on 4th Avenue. I live only five blocks from where this current development is being cited. Um, and to be honest, I've seen the direct impacts for the neighbors who are still left. Many of them have been displaced this past decade alongside our favorite local restaurants and businesses who have been forced out because of the speculation that comes with empty apartments. I am also against this development. There's no way to spin a for-profit development during this time and space. Our current process for land use decisions and creation of affordable housing is broken. We're forcing communities to fake negotiate with the very developers that will displace and harm them. And we're not even really including them. One has to wonder if the limited outreach that Europe already offers is any better when it's digital and inaccessible in many cases. There might be a Spanish translator on this call, but none of the outreach or education has been in either Spanish, Chinese, or Arabic for a community in Sunset Park that's over 50% English isolated. Our communities deserve a better plan and vision. We've been vocal about that. We want real social and public housing. We want nonprofits who stand with us and not just speak for us. And we deserve the level of preservation and care that other richer, whiter communities are able to achieve, whether they're community land trusts or nonprofit developers. I urge two mayoral candidates, both the borough president, but especially my council member, to vote no on this. Community deference has clearly not been achieved through this process. Thank you so much. Okay, our next speaker is Genesis Aquino, followed by Seth Hill and Gary Burns. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, this is Robert, not one more block. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm next. Uh, no, Robert, you're coming up uh, in a little bit. Hi, my name is Hennessy Aquino, and I live in Sunset Park for almost 20 years. I am opposed to this rezoning. 75% market rate is luxury housing for the vast majority of the population that live in CV7, especially in Sunset Park, a low-income immigrant community. 17 units for the people of Sunset Park uh, is not enough. It's not even, we cannot even say that it's a band-aid to the affordable housing crisis that we are experiencing right now. This community has also one of the biggest stock of Session 8, uh, project-based project Session 8 apartments in Brooklyn. And every time the contract fires between the, pri the, the, private, the property owner and HUD, the community gets very tense, right? Uh, approving this development only exacerbates the anguish that all of these tenants feel, about 5,000 tenants in our community. Approving this type of exploitative development where most of the benefit will stay in the packet of the property owners and the developers and now the community only seduces all these local property owners, uh, the ones that are on the Session 8 projects and the ones that are not. Uh, sorry, it, it seduces the property owners uh, to end contracts with affordable housing vouchers and affordable housing uh, contracts with uh, HUD. On the other hand, I think it is important for us to mention that the vast majority of the people do not live in affordable units. The vast majority of the people in CB7 live in non-regulated housing. And we cannot deny the negative impact that building a 75% market rate Building say? will have on our community. Without doubt, it will accelerate displacement. And I say that because most, because these tenants have very, very little to no profession under the New York State law when it comes to eviction. The landlord don't have good cause. They don't need to uh, provide a good cause in housing court. All they need to do is to tell them that they 
want their apartment back and they can raise the rent to rent it to, a, to more uh, affluent people, right? And that's what we have been seeing. I work in the housing court and that's what I've been seeing. Oh, right now we have 40,000 eviction spending. Oh, sure. And, uh, so, have... Sorry, 40,000 eviction cases pending and 20,000 evictions pending in January as of right now. And who's most affected? Tenants who do not live in rent stabilized apartments, who live in neighborhoods where rezoning has been approved and there is no protection right now because we uh, have very little political power to do that, to protect them. Also, as a member of Community Board 7, I hey, what's up? did not approve the decision that was made because we did not give access. We did not allow people to testify. Well, one second, uh, David, you need to unmute as yourself. As a monolingual speaker, as a monolingual speaker, I also find very respectful that there's no real translation. Denise is doing a very good job, but I'm sure she's not getting paid to do this very difficult job of translating, right? There's no Chinese interpretation neither and no Arabic interpretation. Uh, so I hope that in the next hearing you can do better because this community speaks Spanish and speaks Chinese mostly. And I deserve, like people like my mother, my family member, deserve to understand what's going on in their neighborhood. And this is not what's happening right here. Also, the developer did not provide any information to the people that live here. Uh, there was no community outreach. There's nothing that has been done except talking to various members of the community board who do not represent the community as a whole. So I disapprove this rezoning. And I hope uh, Borough President Adams and all the stakeholders demand more. Uh, remember that this land was bought very cheap because it was not meant for housing. It was meant for something else. Right? So if it was bought cheap, we should demand more. Maybe it should be a 75% affordable, if not 100%. So demand more. Uh, we, uh, you are our elected leaders and you are here to represent us, you know, and to hear us and to do what we say, the people. Not just to listen, to, to pretend that you listen and make your own decisions anyways. So thank you for providing the space for people to testify. Okay, our next speaker is Seth Hill, followed by Gary Burns. And then we're going to try to reconnect some of the people who weren't able to testify earlier. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Hey, good evening. My name is Seth Hill, and I'm a local minority contractor. I'd like to start off by just commending. Federal President Eric Adams and the Councilmember Carlos Manchaca for after undertaking such a daunting task in this, this, this pandemic time. But as a minority contractor, I work with a lot of developers along the corridor of Fourth Avenue, and I'm I'm baffled by this because I just we're not even finished yet on two projects, all total, 143 high-end apartments. Along comes Total Development and says which is why I'm in support of them, openly said we're going to get an agreement with local 32 BJ. Therefore, some of the people that are underprivileged, once they get a union job, they'll be qualified to afford one of those 25% permanently affordable house. Two, they make an easement with the MTA. They make an open agreement willing to deal with the artists in the community and local community. And as far as gentrification, it's like a snowball rolling downhill. Change is going to come. So I commend these gentlemen and I'm totally supportive of this project moving forward because it has helped and we can't have everything all the time. There's always gonna be yays and nays, but to openly as a developer told them saying, we're gonna give you 25% of permanently affordable housing to work with the union, to work with the community and to enhance the project of Park Slope because change is gonna come. So I see an open developer come here and say, listen, we first up and to top it off at the end of the day without any government subsidies. I commend you people, I commend the developers, and like I said, Councilman Carlos Manchaca and Federal President Eric Adams, they have their hands full with this board. But at any time I can see affordable housing coming that's guaranteed to be permanent, no government subsidies, I think as a developer, I would want them in my community, helping to build something, whether we start at the top, in the middle, or at the bottom, but there's a start with open transparency. 
Thank you so much, and I yield my time. Okay, thank you, Gary Burns. Gary may be having technical issues. I can't see your mic on. Hey, could we try Sophia Sutcliffe again? Sophia, you're unmuted. Can you speak? Not working with Sophia. And again, it was suggested if people are using headphones to disconnect, that might solve problems. Okay, in that case, we will move on to our next set of speakers. Emmett Mendoza Gaspar, Robert from Not One More Block, and Hannah Birnbaum. There's a Gary Burns that's unmuted. Hi, hello. Hi. Hi. I would like to testify in opposition against the rezoning of this property. Um, <clears throat> as you already know my argument, um, right now we're in the current pandemic. We're at the same time. We're like most, if not all working families in our city are facing a financial crisis where at least more than half of renters right now are trying to make ends meet. Um, at the same time, we're trying to push for development in the site where 75% of the units that are going to be created are not affordable, um, which means that truly, instead of saying that this property is 25% affordable, it, in reality, it's not. Um, at this current moment, um, Totem, um, the people in charge of Totem, like uh, Tucker Reed, um, and a couple more people have worked previously before for two trees. Um, which has historically been tied to the development as well as the flipping of the neighborhood of Dumbo. Um, at the same time, we know that what is going to take place in the next couple of years is not going to be a creation of more affordable units in Sunset Park. It's going to be the creation of more unaffordable units in the neighborhood because in the, under the current and mandatory inclusionary housing program, you have to first create on market rate apartments and then meet a certain threshold before these real estate companies are mandated to create um, a quote unquote affordable units. So in reality, we're actually creating more, more units that are going to continue displacing our people in the neighborhood for crumbs, for pieces of flakes that are truly not going to be open to family members like mine. Um, we recently just stopped the industry city rezoning um, that was being catapulted by Jamestown. And now we're going to get up against another firm with the moniker of Totem. These names like Jamestown and Totem are basically almost like colonizers coming into our neighborhoods, basically with the promise of creating something that will be for the working class. But in reality, we know is only going to be like the first flagship of many more future developments coming into our neighborhood to replace our people. Um, at the moment, I'm not sure who is the, the PR firm for Totem, but I have seen on social media that Jonathan Berlin, not Berlin, Jonathan Rosen, who is one of the co-founders of Berlin Rosen, um, defend, defend this development on Twitter. Um, Berlin Rosen PR is, as you may or may not know, is one of the most recognized PR firms in the nation who have represented top um, developers in the country, like Brookfield, like BlackRock, Pro development firms whose most utmost priority is to create profit for their investors. Um, the fact that we see these people defending the creation of this development site and this project does tie and does create a somewhat linear correlation between what may potentially come here in Sunset Park if this rezoning does move forward and what we may see 
as the future for communities. Um, again, I just want to urge President Adams, who is not here, unfortunately, to please vote no. I understand that at the moment he's running for mayor and most likely he's already getting campaign funds from developers as well. But I just want to urge him just to think about what this will lead to in South Brooklyn and beyond if we are able to vote yes, if he votes yes on this rezoning. Um, it will be the first development that will displace many working class families in Sunset Park. Thank you. Our next speaker is Robert from Not One More Block, followed by Hannah Birnbaum and Pat Palermo. Hi, got me? And Robert, I'm sorry, you requested Spanish translation of your remarks? Uh, yes. Okay. okay, please speak slowly. Absolutely. <clears throat> Actually, if you could do a one or two sentences at a time, that would be easier. You got it. Not a problem. <clears throat> Every rezoning is ethnic cleansing. Uh, excuse me, uh, the Spanish translation was meant from Spanish back to English, not English to Spanish. We would handle that separately on our um, recording. Okay, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking English. I want to translate it to Spanish at some point soon. So people in, who speak that language can understand the comment. Thank you. All right. All right. Uh, every rezoning is ethnic cleansing. I will give an example. In Harlem, between 2000 to 2013, the white population increased by 455%. That is not a joke. 455%, the, the Mecca of black culture, white people while the black population declined by 5%. This was a result of 2003 and 2009 rezonings under Mayor Bloomberg. This is what has essentially happened in every neighborhood that has been rezoned in New York City. It will, of course, happen with this racist result. Affordable housing is not affordable. We must turn our search for housing solutions away from a market-based model of affordable housing, quote unquote. If housing is a human right, it should be taken out of the marketplace. If housing is a human right, then this project is incompatible with the multiple crises facing New York City. Because of the pandemic, estimated one in seven New Yorkers have lost their job and more than 50,000 people are at risk of eviction. As you heard the previous speaker say, there are 20,000 evictions looming January 1st. 20,000. Do you understand what, what kind of crisis that is? This is not a game, Department of City Planning. I see you. Nearly one in every 106 New Yorkers is homeless. One in every 106 New Yorkers in this city. We must turn our search for housing solutions away from a market-based model of quote unquote affordable housing, which is not affordable. This land should be decommodified immediately and public housing should be built there, but the land should be put into a nonprofit community land trust. In 2018, 31.7% of renter households in Sunset Park were severely rent burdened. Eric Adams and council member Machak, if you approve this project, you are not only upholding white supremacy, but are essentially saying that housing is not a human right. I demand you both to firmly oppose this racist rezoning. I yield my time. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Hannah Birnbaum of 32BJ. Hi, can you? Followed by Pat Palermo and Theo Chino. Can, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes. Okay. 
Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Hannah. I'm a representative of 32BJ. I'm speaking tonight on behalf of the union to express our support for the proposed project at 737 4th Ave. 32BJ supports responsible development that includes a credible commitment to prevailing wage building service jobs. Um, and I, I'm happy to report that TOTEM, um, which is developing this project, has made a commitment uh, to provide good prevailing wage jobs at this site. Um, we view this new development project as an example of responsible development on the jobs basis, but we also fully support um, the permanently affordable housing that the project will bring to the neighborhood. And um, we respectfully urge you to approve the rezoning. Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker is Pat Palermo followed by Theo Chino and Antoinette Martinez. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name's Pat Palermo. I'm a 15 year resident of Sunset Park, 26th Street and 3rd Avenue, uh, very close to the pr proposed development. Um, and if the luxury class wanted to live here, well, there's good news. They could afford to live here. They don't need more housing. We are in the middle of a pandemic and very possibly depopulation of the New York City area. The idea of giving away this land to the luxury class is frankly insane. Uh, this, what this offer is to me and my neighbors seems to be, we'll blight your skyline, we'll raise your rent, and we'll push all your friends and loved ones out and render your neighborhood something unrecognizable. Uh, I am proud to have worked for the successful candidacy of housing advocate, uh, Marcella Matanes, who's now going to the State House. And I would like, and in that spirit, I'd like to remind uh, President Adams and uh, Ca Councilman Manchaka, who is my councilman, that we are lucky as Democratic voters to have a lot of candidates to pick from this year. And um, even with ranked choice voting, um, while I don't know how it, what, how Scott Stringer or anybody else would have voted, I will definitely know which one of you voted to upend my neighborhood and uh, and <clears throat> um, exile my neighbors from affordable housing. So this is a warning. Know where your voters are and know that we're talking to each other and we're watching you. Thank you. I, I learned the rest of my time. Okay. Our next speaker is Theo Chino, followed by Antoinette Martinez and John Santora. Yeah, hi. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Theo Chino. I'm not here as a public candidate, a public advocate candidate, but as an HPD victim. Uh, I would urge everybody to look at the PBS Frontline Poverty, Politics and Profit to understand what your project in Sunset Park is. This is funny because I was a member of Community Board 9 in Manhattan when Columbia University was proposing some similar project. And I can tell you, I pay $169 rent for a three bedroom apartment because we're fighting like hell. And my neighbor down the street, they're paying $3,000 for a studio. Why is that? Because we as a building fought MIH. We have been driving, the, we have been fighting to make sure that all the number, like Maria Rocca said at the beginning, show us the number. We build a website called show us the book, show the book.org for anyone to participate. Now, these projects will lead to everything that everybody said before, because it's true. If you want to see it, come to Harlem, like one blog just said five minutes ago. You will see the damage that has happened. You don't need to go anywhere else. About Tucker, Tucker presentation was red flag after red flag. If you look at that PBS frontline poverty, politic and profit, you will understand that actually they took that land on the cheap from someone else who was there in the community. That person wanted to make a profit and that's okay. But what they're doing is they're using the system to make money and they're going to use tax credit. And that is how they make money. So, yes, they say they don't get government uh, subsidy, but they will get those tax credit. And that's a form of subsidy. 
So it is time that the people who will vote tonight or the next meeting vote no. Do not let Sunset Park become what West Harlem has become. Take our word, fight for your neighborhood and join all of us. If you want to check it out, you know my Twitter, I saw Rodrigo earlier, it's Tio Chino, so join anything, fight for your neighborhood. And I came just to say, don't do it. Please put a moratorium, but this is bigger actually. So fight these people. Tucker, if you want to talk about your development and what is wrong, with your system, please reach out to me as well at Tiochino because you are part of the problem, but you need to be part of the solution. And so as an HPD victim, we are calling for transparency and investigation everywhere. HPD, NYCHA, Home, Department of Homeless Services, because that's where the problem lies. The city is selling our land on the cheap to developer. How can you look into Acres, everybody? Go into Acres and you will see land sold for $4,000 with the mayor's signature when it should have been going to an auction. Look it up. At showthebook.org, we have team of people who are victim that are looking at the lottery, how the lottery is a scam, how the, the, the low income uh, MIH, low housing is a scam. As you said, 100 units will be market. That means people will be paying more than what they should, and that will raise everybody's rent. So fight, fight, and fight. And Eric Adams, like you said on the program, when you said you cared about the people from Kansas coming in your neighborhood, I asked you that question on Brian Layer. Now is the time to show it. Vote no. Manchaca, vota no también porque es tiempo que esto pare. Hasta siempre. Bye. Okay, our next speaker is Antoinette Martinez, followed by John Santori and Joseph Kessler. Hi, everyone. My name is Antoinette Martinez. I'm a member of Community Board 7, chair of the Neighborhood Advisory Board, and a lifelong resident of Sunset Park. And today, I'd like to speak directly to Richard Barrick, Borough President Eric Adams, who is not here, and Carlos Menchaca. This past year has been extremely challenging for way too many reasons. And if there is one thing 2020 has taught us, it's that we need to do more to protect our most vulnerable. And this proposal to rezone 737 Fourth Avenue is not the best that we can do. Introducing a 14 story tower and 100 unregulated market rate apartments on 25th Street and 4th Avenue will worsen displacement pressures in a section of Sunset Park that is already facing the highest rate of displacement in the neighborhood. Just today, I saw an ad for a two-bedroom apartment going for close to $3,600, three blocks away from where this proposed project is set to be. So if we're already seeing a spike in rents, we'll only continue to see them soar with projects like this about rezoning. We need to think bigger than just promising Community Board 7, 17 quote unquote affordable one bedroom units. We need Council Member Carlos Menchaca and Borough President Eric Adams who have a major say in whether this project is approved and who are both running for mayor to examine your housing platform and decide whether you're going to continue pushing this failed MIH policy, or if you're going to be bold and push for what our most vulnerable need, which is investment of permanently, deeply affordable housing. We need you to be bold and vote against this proposal. Right now, we need a moratorium on all rezonings in New York City. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have John Santori, Joseph Kessler, and Marcella Mittains.
Joseph? Hi. Am I on? Yes, you are. Sorry about that. Hi. Uh, my name is Yosef. I'm a lifelong New Yorker and Brooklyn resident. I support this project uh, for a few reasons. One, the city desperately needs more housing of all kinds. As much as of the housing crisis has been caused by the fact that housing supply has simply not kept up with population growth in recent years. Number two, the city desperately needs more permanent affordable units. This project creates 40 affordable permanent units. That's 40 homes and 40 families that will benefit from new permanently affordable homes. Three, this project will take a Dunkin Donuts and a parking lot on a very dangerous stretch of 4th Avenue and build homes for people next to a train station. This would make a life-saving street safety improvement to the to the, a otherwise car centric block and provide a transit oriented development which the city needs more of if we want to combat climate change for this project would build secure bike parking that is free for the community and there are many working cyclists in sunset park which is the backbone of the delivery worker economy and who would greatly benefit from this facility and five this would create good union jobs like for 32 BJ. And I've heard a lot of people that are concerned that this development would lead to gentrification and displacement, but there's actually evidence on the contrary. In order to increase affordability, we need to build more housing where there isn't enough. Increasing the supply of market rate housing helps relieve pressure on the housing market and adding 30% more affordable housing units from this project alone to the neighborhood will help relieve pressure on the affordable housing lottery. In fact, preventing new housing only serves to strengthen the bidding war over the few available market rate housing units available and increases rents and that helps push people out of their homes. So that's actually counterproductive. So I would strongly encourage Borough President Adams and council member Menchaca to support good housing development projects like 737 4th Avenue that will provide, a, provide affordable homes for families and have many other tangible benefits to the community. Thank you. Hey, could we try John Centaur again? Still not moving. Okay. Uh, and are we, we're unable to connect with Gary Burns? Correct. Or Sophia Sotcliffe? Correct also. Or Jorge Muniz Reyes? And again, if there's any uh, telephone option for them to call in, that's also helpful. Okay, we can uh, share our slide that contains the call-in information. The next speakers are Marcella Mitaines, Daniel Libor, and Limor Gorin. Marcella also has issues. Okay, can we move on to Daniel Libor and Limor Gorin? Uh, thank you for your time and uh, appreciate uh, everybody's uh, effort in, in, in testifying today. Uh, I actually thought the way uh, uh, Joseph Kessler phrased everything earlier uh, was very succinct. I'm also in favor for this rezoning. Um, there has been a lot of talk about displacement and I, I feel like the only thing that's getting displaced um, is is a Dunkin' Donuts, which has been sold to a multi-billion-dollar uh, uh, private hedge fund, um, and right now there's I think 80 total units in of affordable housing in Sunset Park. Uh, this project would add uh, 40 units, which is basically 50% of what's currently existing, and I think that would be a benefit to the community. Um, and um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, that's I yield the rest of my time. Okay, so the next speakers are Limor Gorin, 
Alap Vora and Shabazz Stewart. Hi, um, I'd like to speak um, in support of this project um, for most of the same reason as the last two speakers. I think many of the people that oppose that are justifiably worried about um, displacement and a lack of um, housing. And it's true that we have a housing crisis. And the solution to a housing crisis is to build more apartments, more houses, not less. Um, if somebody lives in a parking lot of the Dunkin' Donuts, um, they should probably be um, um, given some other kind of accommodations. Uh, we don't need the Dunkin' Donuts in the neighborhood. Um, not only it's owned by a hedge fund, um, it also sells um, sugar and things that are not really healthy for residents and don't contribute to health. Um, we don't need the drug deals that are happening in the, in the parking lot. We do need more housing. 40 affordable units is great. And to be honest, even the non-affordable units is more housing. And when you have more housing and more available units, it drops prices of all units. So if people care about prices going up, the only solution for that is to build more units. And um, as a um, Brooklyn resident for the past 15 years, and I'm an immigrant myself, um, I wish um, this project to go through. Thank you. David, do we have that slide that has the uh, phone numbers for those who are having computer issues when we're through with those who can access on the computer? Yeah, I can get that going. I'm trying to get John Santor up. John, can you hear? If you can, can you try to speak? I've unmuted you. John, you're unmuted. All right, so John doesn't seem to be working. And again, if we get a phone number for John to call in, that would help him have an opportunity. Okay, we have Ala Pavora, followed by Shabazz Stewart and Jackie Painter. Hola, you're unmuted. I think Shabazz is ready to speak. I can wait. I, 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 I want to be uh, I want to be respectful of everyone else who's on. Okay. Let's give a lap a second. A lap. Yeah, can you guys hear me? I'm sorry. Yes. Sorry about that. I'm trying to put the baby down. Um, my name is Lop Vore. I'm a lifelong uh, Brooklynite, born and raised in the borough, not too far away from this development site. And I'm also a small business owner during a, a very difficult time for many of us. And I am emphatically in favor of this project. I mean, um, what we're talking about is you know, a lot of people have have kind of covered a lot of different topics today, but to me, it's it's pretty simple. It's 
right now we have one business that is not a local business, that is not a small business, that's providing maybe a handful of jobs versus what can be, you know, whatever, uh, you know, your imagination uh, might be for a development that will have, I would assume, hundreds of jobs when it has a much larger retail from what I've seen. Uh, it would create jobs for those that work in that complex. Uh, the housing situation that people are talking about may or may not be solved overnight, but this is going to create at least, uh, you know, the number might be off, but I've been hearing 17 or 25 or whatever it is. It's still 17 or 25 more units that exist right now on that space or in the community. And um, I don't see, uh, you know, the justification for saying no to private development when it's going to do, you know, uh, what it's required to do. And it's to create housing that's affordable uh, and create a safe haven for an area and a block that's very desolate. And, um, you know, I, I'm in favor of job creation. Someone mentioned that earlier on the call that, you know, uh, joblessness is an issue right now. And I think a new development would certainly create new jobs. I don't think anybody can argue that. So uh, I am in favor of the project and uh, yep, I yield my time. Okay, Shabazz Stewart, followed by Jackie Painter. And our last speaker is E. Townsend West. Uh, hi, my name is um, Shabazz Stewart. I'm the founder and CEO of Uni. Um, I am um, a vendor in this project. I'm working with the developer to bring a secure bike parking station um, to serve residents of the community for free, uh, many of whom are uh, working cyclists. Um, I do this work because um, building transportation alternative infrastructure um, is impactful and meaningful to me. Um, I spent, you know, I grew up in Brooklyn, a uh, lifelong Brooklyn resident. Half of my childhood was spent in housing. Um, and, you know, I, I just want to clear the air about why we um, and our company partnered on the project. Um, displacement is a word that's been used again and again tonight. Since I was a child, Brooklyn has added the population of Pittsburgh, that's 350,000 people um, population and virtually no housing stock. Every day, every year that we let market rate housing sit around and we don't add housing stock and we add population, um, our homes get more and more and more and more expensive. Um, the vast majority of us live in market rate housing. Um, the vast majority of us are at risk of seeing our rent um, exponentially grow every single year as more and more people try to live in a borough that has the exact same housing stock as it did back in the year 2000. So, no, this project isn't perfect, and no, this project isn't going to solve all the housing needs of Sunset Park, let alone New York City, but as someone who grew up in a well, housing, 35 units is not insignificant, it's not counterproductive, it's not scraps. 100 units of housing is not insignificant, it's not scraps. Um, this project is a step in the right direction. And in a city where there's some bad developments and plenty of good developments, that's something that we thought was worthy of uh, supporting and partnering with. Thank you, I yield my time. Okay, our next speaker is Jackie Painter, followed by E. Townsend West and Catherine Walsh. And then we'll get to the phone calls. Hey, good evening, everyone. My name is Jackie Painter, and I'm from the neighboring community of Red Hook, where we have seen very similar developments, cause displacement and gentrification, and completely change our community from what it used to be. For this reason, I oppose this project. We need to be focused on 100% of a public affordable housing and keeping people from currently being displaced and evicted from their homes. Allowing 2017 or even 30 quote unquote affordable units is to, you know, to pass in this is, is just simply not enough. 
We're already facing a crazy housing disaster when the eviction moratorium expires. Tens of thousands of people in District 38 who have not been able to afford rent will face an even greater rent burden when these rents skyrocket in the community because of developments like these. This project is really not about the existing community of Sunset Park. And as I always say, bringing gentrification, which will be bring displacement, period. The shiny new development uh, with an overwhelmingly majority of non-affordable units will bring new people into the neighborhood and drive up neighborhood rent prices. There really is no argument that proves different. It's profiting off suffering and displacement of a working community right now for shareholders in this company who have no stake in this community. The net damage far outweighs the relatively little amount that these small percentage of affordable units will offer. As I said again, it will increase the rent and displace working class people during this pandemic. After stopping the industry city rezoning, passing this development will be inconsistent with that position by allowing another developer to come in to change the neighborhood. It's being labeled as helping the housing crisis, but I repeat, in reality, it will be a driver of this crisis by increasing overall rent prices. I'm very disappointed in this webinar tonight, not being inclusive in terms of platform and language needs, and that the borough president himself is not president. Borough President Eric Adams and City Council Member Carlos Menchaca, who are both running for mayor, I urge you to stand with the people. I urge you to demand better for the people, please. And I yield the rest of my time. Okay. We have three more speakers. E. Townsend West, followed by Catherine Walsh and Noah Parks. E. Townsend, you're unmuted. Can you speak? You know, we may have to go back to E. Townsend later. Okay. Catherine. Right, so you can try the phone then as well. Catherine Walsh is our next speaker. Hi, great, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Thank you, thanks Richard. Um, I um, really appreciate you know hearing the testimony of everyone tonight. My name is Catherine Walsh. I am a, a Sunset Park born and raised resident. I'm on the community board seven. I was um, voted no on this rezoning proposal um, when it came through. I know we've heard a lot from the uh, panelists and attendees tonight to talk about, you know, the pros and cons of this proposal. And I, I feel like overwhelmingly from the people who've now been on the line for four hours, you have heard why they're opposing the proposal. And there's been this appeal to our uh, council member and our borough president, you know, appealing to them as candidates running for mayor, um, appealing also to think about our most vulnerable neighbors um, and what this, you know, spot rezoning would look like. Um, and what I would like to just, you know, echo and amplify and, and add to is appeal to, to your um, sense of what it means to be a New Yorker and what it means, what makes you proud to be a New Yorker and what makes you really speak to, you know, the, the history and the future of, you know, our community and our district and really what we're, what we're fighting for. And, and most people, I don't think, know that Sunset Park was actually, you know, the birthplace of the cooperative housing movement. So when immigrants moved to that neighborhood, working class immigrants, they built the first cooperative housing units in the country and it inspired the cooperative housing movement all over the United States and that legacy. And what we need in this moment is not incremental, you know, um, recommendations of you know 25 percent affordable housing what we need is actually bold leadership and we need to think about the new york of the future and take this as a chance to think about what we're building in the next five to ten years and so again you know appealing to you what does it mean to be a new yorker what is the kind of community and district that you know we're fighting for to protect um and the, and the future home so thank you Okay, 
and our last speaker is Noah Parks. Hi, yeah, my name is Noah Parks. Uh, it is my testimony that this development is a disservice to the families, business owners, and working people of, uh, of Sunset Park and near Sunset Park. I would ask that the president and council member reject this application vehemently and publicly uh, to dissuade future development. Uh, this is an opportunity to crystallize a movement against this kind of development where they put this smoke screen of um, helping with uh, affordable housing up front and they almost have like an MA a uh, master's group working on this, like it's some project here where we are. We need housing justice for all in this neighborhood. Um, and I would encourage the president and council member to invest publicly in the people in, their, in this neighborhood instead of working with the private uh, developers to try to solve uh, the housing shortage. Um, I would like to ask them again to publicly uh, dissuade uh, development. Uh, this is an opportunity to crystallize a movement and be known for stopping the gentrification of Sunset Park. Thank you. Okay, we're going to try John F. Hi, uh, first of all, I really hate how this meeting was run. Um, I think you guys could have done a better job of delegating and moving people forward. And I think it's undemocratic. The fact that it's got stretched out for so long, it um, makes people exhausted and it diminishes uh, how we're heard. I strongly oppose this development. I had something written forever ago and it's somewhere in my documents. Uh, basically, uh, this is a, uh, uh, the uh, MIH is a failed project. It's a tro Trojan horse for gentrification that trades small token affordable units uh, for permission to build big, ugly, and expensive uh, stuff on the city's dime. Uh, right now, I know it's no question and answer, but I would love to have some validation from the uh, 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 people running this that Menchaca is still listening, or if he checked out, I would like to know when he checked out. Uh, we need a moratorium on all Orlups, or however you say it, until we treat uh, until the threat of COVID subsides. Um, I hope Eric Adams and Menchaca are hearing this and that they understand that as a community, a lot of us are very broke, underemployed, very bored and paying attention to politics right now. And we're all slowly finding each other. And I think uh, you should, as Paul, as people running for, for mayor, you should quietly measure for yourself just how much leverage these very bored people and very angry people are gonna get and let that make you adjust your campaigns accordingly. I, I, give, I give the rest of my time to the room. Thank you. Okay, can we try E Townsend West again? It's unmuted. And Councilmember Chaka is still listening and he just uh, uh, chatted. And if we could soon then start with the phone after uh, the speaker. The phones are unmuted. Please state your name first. Uh, this is John Cantor. I'm on the phone. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, also, I'm Marcella Matanis, I think, has to speak as well. So if she could be given time. Um, so I just want to uh, uh, say who I am. I live in Sunset Park. I've lived in Sunset Park since 2016. I'm in my third apartment in Sunset Park. Um, I live with two roommates currently. Uh, before that, I lived with two roommates. Before that, I lived with two roommates. I've never lived in my own place because I can't afford it. Um, I'm in the first position now where I theoretically could afford my own place, but I would still have to provide 50% of my income after taxes to rent. So theoretically, this is the kind of project that should appeal to me, um, but I'm against the project. 
um, for several reasons. And I just want to, I just want to go back to the first comment, Maria Roca. Um, this is not a community design project. I understand that Totem talked to uh, nonprofits and they talked to members of the community board and they've talked to elected officials, but what we never had in the community is an actual conversation of the real finances behind this project. What uh, is the actual amount of money that the developer is going to make? Occasionally, a number will come out of a public hearing. For example, Totem has said that they paid $14 million for the land. Uh, during one of the last hearings, Mr. Reed said that the MIH component is the equivalent to, and I'm paraphrasing him, but he said something like uh, a $30 million donation to the community. These are the kinds of uh, core issues, the actual money issues, that we would actually need to talk about in the community if this was a publicly designed project so that we could actually understand what are our housing options before us. But we've never had that conversation. Everybody should be brought in. The nonprofits should be brought in. Fifth Avenue Committee, which is, of course, endorsing this project, should be part of that. But everybody should be part of that so that we can think creatively and, in a, in a, frankly, in, in an optimistic and a joyous way about how we can figure out how to create more fully affordable housing for this community. I just want to say one last thing about what's going to happen now. I think what's likely to happen is the borough president and Councilmember Chaka are both going to say we're against the project as it stands but let's see what we can get out of it through the ULERP process. And I would simply say, if the goal is to renegotiate this plan, then what we're really talking about is a, the kind of democratic engagement that should have happened from the beginning. So let's take it out of ULERP. There's no reason why that should happen under the time crunch of ULERP, under the pressure of ULERP, as a project like this is gradually removed farther and farther from the community with, with that it actually uh, affects. Um, I think there's some concern that aldermanic privilege is gone, that, that the developer might now try to just go to the full council. We saw that with Industry City. I hope that, that the, the, the full council doesn't accept that and understand that we should be working, communities should be working uh, together in a public and transparent way to really explore the options that are before them and create the kind of housing future that they want for uh, their people. And I just want to end by saying that at least four of the six council candidates uh, for, for this district are against this project. The incoming state assemblywoman is against this project. The outgoing, she's also the outgoing chair of the housing committee on CB7, she's against the project. Both of the incoming chairs of CB7's housing committee are against this project. I think that says a lot about the fact that this project has not convinced people who are deeply interested in creating affordable housing and opportunity in this community. They have not been convinced that this is a good idea and that this is a, a good proposal. So I think the project should be dropped. It should be removed from Europe. Mr. Reed has said publicly that nothing will happen in, in, with the land. Then the developer can come back to the community and we can craft a, a plan that works for everybody and we can really understand the options and alternatives and that are that are before uh, us. So thank you very much, and I uh, yield my time. Okay, could we try Marcella Mateens on the phone? Oh. Hi. Good evening. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Um, my name is Marcelo Martinez. Um, Sunset Park is a diverse neighborhood. New York City community. I moved to Marcella, Sunset you may Park need to turn your computer off or uh, something to avoid feedback. Okay, hold on. All right, can you hear me? Is this better? Excellent. Okay. Sunset Park is a diverse neighborhood. It is one of the last real New York City communities. I moved to Sunset Park in 1978 when I was five years old, part of an immigrant family who migrated from Peru to New York for a better life. But Sunset Park was very different in the late 70s than it is today. My family and I moved here because it was affordable at the time, despite not particularly being desirable. We, along with other neighbors, set roots here. We attended the local schools, patronized the local businesses, attended the local places of worship, 
and help make Sunset Park a vibrant, flourishing community. We were already seeing and feeling the impact as residential and commercial tenant displacement pressures have risen in our gentrifying neighborhood. But now we are reeling from a pandemic, which is looking at a second wave. This application cannot move forward because it lacks a comprehensive look at how this rezoning will impact the neighborhood. There is no racial or ethnic impact study conducting, conducted examining impact of proposed rezoning on equity, direct and indirect residential displacement, direct and indirect business displacement in Community Board 7. There is no creation of a local restricted residential unit database to allow for research and data tracking of rent restricted units to be able to say that this will help the affordable housing crisis. There is no comprehensive analytical data or study results available examining increased harassment pressures for residential housing and community board seven. There is no available studies examining home and property sale price changes for homeowners pre rezoning. There is no comprehensive study examining the impact of several other project developments currently in progress in community board seven as well as no study of neighboring current or potential rezoning or past rezonings of Sunset Park and their impacts on direct and indirect displacement and housing affordability. <clears throat> to be able to consider and determine how this proposed rezoning will fundamentally change the character, diversity, and makeup of the neighborhood, there is need for further study. We as residents are experts in our lived experiences and we know this rezoning is not good for us, but only benefits the developer and the owner. Therefore, you must allow, you must not allow this proposed rezoning to move forward. And I challenge both mayoral candidates to be leaders in the call for a moratorium on all rezoning, to stand up to real estate interests and to put people before profits. Thank you. Okay, we have Sophia Sutcliffe joining by phone. Hi, um, my name is Sophia Sutcliffe and I'm here to say something similar that I have to say in these hearings every time. Um, and that's that we cannot as a city continue to use a process for land use changes that fails to account for the racial impact of upzoning. I'm here to ask Borough President Eric Adams and Councilmember Menchaca to vote no on this proposal and push for a moratorium on rezonings. And I know it takes time to change the processes that institutions use and with them uproot the structural racism that they per perpetuate. And this government won't have the time to work out a process to fix the flaws in the ULERT process when it's constantly having to react to developers' plans and proposals. And the community won't have time to come up with alternative plans to the, when we say no to the developers' ones, if we're constantly having to say no to what the developers putting on the table because it, it's never enough, it's always for them. The flaws in the ULERT process left by both Mayor Bloomberg and de Blasio with a stained record of deep racial displacement. And we have the benefit of hindsight here. And I'm pleading that as potential leaders of this great city that you say no to this rezoning and do everything in your power to place a moratorium on rezonings until we sort this thing out. Don't let private developers and investors determine the future of this city and cash out on the deep pain um, and economic uh, uh, lack of um, economic recession that we're, we're feeling um, because of this pandemic. Um, don't let them push out and profit on the back of families that made this city great to make way for the grandchildren of the people who fled decades ago when the government offered them a subsidy to buy homes in the suburbs. I beg you to invest in the people that are invested in the city to preserve land that's affordable to the immigrants that keep this city running day and night and not continue with this status quo of development in New York. People might critique the stance as against all development and dangerous in the current economic circumstances. And to that, I say the handful of affordable apartments they are offering to our district will not make up for the increases to rent that we can expect. A recent study from the Center for Regional and Urban Affairs found that new market, and this looked at um, sub-market effects of, of new development found that new market rate construction increased rent by 6.6% in the lowest rent tercile. That means the lowest 30% of rents available in the region. It didn't have any effect on the rents in the middle um, and decreased rents by 
3.2% and the highest third of um, housing available. Um, and that makes a lot of sense to me. If we build more on affordable housing, it makes a neighborhood, it, it might help with supply and demand issues with the most expensive uh, part of the market, but it, it decreases the amount of affordable housing that we have available. Um, it makes a neighborhood more attractive for newcomer, newcomers and increases the status quo of rent. This development will do more harm than good for the families that made in this neighborhood the vibrant community it is today. And I ask you to be bold here and use your voice to push for a moratorium on rezonings until we can put forward a set of benchmarks that make developers answer to the racial displacement that they're trying to profit off of. Thank you and good night. Okay, we have one more speaker by phone, E. Townsend West. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, oh good. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, so I, I, I don't want to speak for too long. Um, I, I just, you know, I, I have to say, you know, I've, I've been in the area for over 20 years and I've been displaced myself from, from apartments in the area. Um, and, you know, it's already difficult. And, um, you know, personally, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a public school teacher. I have a salary. I can, you know, I can afford my rent, but it's, it's, it's hard for me already. Um, not to mention my neighbors and my students who I've already been seeing year after year, having to leave, not just the neighborhood, but they're leaving the borough, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're even going as far as New Jersey. Um, and they're still coming back here to work. Their parents are still coming back here to work. Um, and I, I just think it's shameful that we can't take care of the people who take care of us. These are, are the, the backbone of our, of our um, society. And yet we, we, we think um, that, that we can't do any better than get, giving them a lottery to sign up for, I, I think that, that, that they said it was 17, po you know, potentially affordable units. That's not acceptable. That's not, it's, 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 it's um, and, and I also want to address what some people were saying. Um, so yeah, I, I, I just want, want to back up again and say, you know, the locals who have grown up here, whose parents have, have, have worked here, um, they're, you know, they're, they're often the essential workers and they are no longer able to, to afford to live here. And I, I just think it's shameful. Um, so, um, and, and I want to address a, a fallacy that I, I heard from a few folks, one of whom I, I, I looked up and was surprised to realize is in real estate himself. So I, I guess that, you know, that that's their perspective and they're entitled to that. But I, I, I do think that that the fallacy should be addressed, which is that th this discussion is not between whether we should keep a, a Dunkin' Donuts and whether or not w we should have housing. It's not an either or. It's not either Dunkin' Donuts or housing. It's a false choice. Th this choice is between this, it's, it's between this proposal that's in front of us and the proposals that we deserve. Um, this community is very underserved already, and we don't need to grovel for scraps. We, we need to stand up and fight for proposals uh, for, for housing that is affordable um, and, and is what the people of our community deserve. Thank you. Do we have any other speakers in the phone or any more on the chat? No more on the phones. Nina, is there anyone else?
Ava. I think Jacqueline would like to speak. To Jacqueline Boss, I'm not sure if that's correct. And that's on the computer, uh, on the WebEx, not a phone, right? On the WebEx, okay. yes. If you can unmute her. I think she's still on mute. Um, no, she's not unmuted. She's in the system. Her audio is not connected on her device. Oh, wait, wait, it's coming online. Yeah, the interface on this WebEx is so much, so similar, but so different. <laughs> then, uh, Welcome. Um, okay, let me lower this a little bit. You can hear me, right? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, okay, I'm just kind of coming together with like, you know, some of the notes I've been writing uh, while listening to this. And it looks like a lot of people have touched upon, you know, certain things. Um, you know, I've been I'm really proud of how people have been tackling certain kinds of disinformation that's been going on, um, particularly with, uh, you know, those coming from who support it. Um, basically, I don't know, like, again, 30 something, I don't know, it keeps fluctuating between 17 to 30. Um, let's be, we can be hopeful and say 30, um, but 30 something affordable units and, you know, and then 100 marketplace units, like, I, I know that the motto is that something is better than nothing, but for this specific circumstance, it doesn't call for that. That's just not, <laughs> it's not how that should, it, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't in this case. Um, it's so, it's short-sighted because it doesn't help the community. And you, you've heard from our neighbors, you've heard from an overwhelming, honestly, like this feels like a majority and the ones who have been opposing feel like the minority in, in, this, in this circumstance. Um, and you've heard them, you've heard the community and you've heard that there are so many people that are in need of help. Um, and so here's one thing I just want to say, uh, <laughs> so, um, a lot of people spoke on the possibility of losing this opportunity, like quote unquote, losing this opportunity, but that is pretty on par with that same psychology of like, when you're, you know, on Instagram, you get ads that are like, you know, this dress is going to run is going to, you know, sell out and, and you'll never get it again. And it's like, no, they. <laughs> then come back, you know, it's, it's, and that's kind of the thing with Sunset Park is that all eyes are on us. And this is not going to be the last time that you're going to hear from any of these people, because we're going to have more hearings like this in the future. And you, you can expect these people to come back because we're getting more and more, you know, involved because we're seeing what's going on and what's been set up without telling us what, who, you know, who's getting information, who's not getting information and it, you know, we're looking out and we're hearing it and we're looking at all the plot holes in this and there are a lot of plot holes in this. Um, so, you know, <laughs> it, it's, let me just look at my notes. <laughs> um, there, so there will be more on the horizon and I can tell you that for sure. So we as a community deserve the right to skip out on certain projects that don't, don't benefit us. They're not good enough. Let's, let's be clear. Let's exercise the possibility of saying that certain things are not good for us. Some things can be a little bit good. Um, certain, I would say that maybe tone can be kind of nice. Sure. But it doesn't, it doesn't, they're still ignoring the fact that they're going to bring in like a big tide that this community is not ready for. And I want to stress the fact that just because you're a good person doesn't mean that you're not incapable of doing bad things, even like, you know, on accident or whatever. But, um, you know, so I just want to keep that in mind because we, we as a community, we deserve a lot more that we deserve more than this. There's, there's power in every single sunset Parker right now. 
uh, being able to know this sunset people of sunset park you have the power so let's kind of bring our power together and say no i oppose this project and yes i deserve better and it's not going to be this project and probably not the next project but you know we get the we want to get the say to say this helps this does not help in this case this project does not help thank you please vote no and have a good night So I believe we're out of uh, speakers. I think we have Jorge Munez on the phone that would like to speak. Jorge Munez. I'm here. Hello, okay. can you guys hear me? Yes. Hello. Oh, you're welcome. Here. Perfect. All right. Uh, thank you guys. You may need to step away from the computer or to another space to be without feedback. Oh, I see. Um, I'm, I'm, gonna, I, I'm just in the car driving, unfortunately. Uh, can, is the connection okay? Hello? Yes, yes. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and share. Um, I'll keep it brief. My name is Jorge Muñiz Reyes. Um, soy Mexicano, nacido in Brooklyn, living in Sunset Park, and I'm here uh, to say no to this corporate city planning that right now is seeking to replace manufacturing land in, in Sunset Park in, in my home and in my neighborhood with about 100 new luxury apartments. Um, and I'm also here tonight to say yes to public city planning that our elected officials here tonight can really prioritize and fund if they make real choices and real decisions to create 100 percent affordable housing for the low income working people of Sunset Park who need it. And I don't think we need to settle for anything less. Um, and, you know, just, just to remind everybody, the reason we're here tonight is because two years ago, some real estate speculators and a group of millionaires, millionaires decided to buy this lot that was zoned for manufacturing and, and working class job opportunities. And instead of honoring the, the legacy of that land, instead of building with it and, and building upon it, they wanted to replace it. They wanted to erase it. And they wanted to erase working class opportunities to put this 14 story luxury tower. And so y'all have already heard tonight about how bad of a deal this is. Um, and, you know, I don't think I need to convince, you know, those of you that have been listening about why this plan for 100 luxury apartments in exchange for maybe 10, 17 affordable ones is a good one. It's a bad deal. And Sunset Park, you can't play with Sunset Park because you, we know what good affordable housing looks like. We created some of the very first affordable housing that ever existed in New York and the cooperative houses that are right around the park. We have 100% affordable housing going up right now on 4th Avenue. Um, so we know what good affordable housing looks like, and we can demand it, and we should not settle for anything less. This is a bad deal. It's a bad plan, and we need to be only saying yes to 100% affordable housing. And don't tell me that there's not money for it, because right now in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, this mayor is taking about $100 million of our tax dollars and giving it to a corporate television studio uh, to, to build it on our waterfront, something nobody asked for. So we could be taking that, those dollars right now and be using it to put community land into, into trust, into public trust, and be creating real affordable housing. So that's the only affordable housing I think we need to be supporting. And I would encourage anybody, especially people that think that they want to run for mayor, like City Council Member Menchaca and, and Borough President Eric Adams, that really this neighborhood will remember what you do. And uh, you guys need to pick a side. And we hope that you stand with working people for 100% affordable housing and that you say no to this half-baked, incomplete, speculative plan that's only really here to put Park Slope first and Sunset Park last. We're not here for that. Um, and, and again, we want you to be very really clear and really courageous, say no to luxury housing, and, and really start making strides towards 100% real low-income affordable housing. Thank you very much, and I hope that you know, all of us can, can take the time that we need to protect Sunset Park. Thank you. I yield the rest of my time. Dina, can you uh, get the name of the last speaker you have? Ivan? Ivan Lynn?
Um, can you guys hear me? Yes, um, hi, I'm Ivan. I'm a 17 year old high schooler who resides in um, Brooklyn 11228. I am a frequent visitor of Sunset Park and um, I am here to oppose the proposed um, rezoning plan. Um, I believe this plan will only increase the rent and um, it's a shame that only 30 to 35 out of the 150 housing units are affordable. Um, I believe it's a shame that um, this uh, this developer company that is working on this isn't pushing for more and is only doing the bare minimum. Um, I request that there should be more um, affordable housing units and. Sorry, I seem to be unmuted some. OK, so I believe that um, I believe that afford more full more housing should be pushed forward and that um, that these affordable housings are housing units are also reserved for the members of Sunset Park and not just 50% um, or so. And um, I also want to note that um, this proposed uh, rezoning plan will also create rippling effects towards other um, nearby communities, such as the Chinatown of Brooklyn um, eight, in 8th Avenue. Um, in 8th Avenue, there's uh, hundreds of small businesses um, immigrant owned businesses, Asian American owned businesses, uh, Mexican owned businesses. And I believe that the increasing rent will only exacerbate the crisis where um, I remember last week I was just walking through Sunset Park and 8th Avenue and there was a ton of for rent signs because they can't afford rent and these businesses are going out of business. I believe that this plan will only exacerbate that crisis and I, um, I push that um, these uh, city council members vote no for this plan and look for a better alternative to this. Thank you. More speakers. I don't see on my end. Ina, do you see any? Did we get Jorge Muniz? Yes. He okay. called in. Great. Great. I don't think there is anybody else. Okay. If we can are, do one last call. Okay. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Hearing none, Richard, if you could please close this calendar item. Calendar item number three is closed. The hearing on these items is now closed. Thank you for participating in this remote public hearing. Borough President Adams will review the applications heard today and submit his recommendations to the City Planning Commission for further consideration. La audiencia sobre estos artículos ahora está cerrada. Gracias por participar en esta audiencia pública remota. El presidente Adams revisará las solicitudes escuchadas hoy y enviará sus recomendaciones a la Comisión de Planificación de la Ciudad para una consideración adicional. Borough President Adams would like to take this opportunity to remind you that the City Planning Commission will hold a public hearing on these items which will be announced at a later date. El presidente Adams descargaría aprovechar esta oportunidad para recordarle que la Comisión de Planificación de la Ciudad llevará a cabo una audiencia pública sobre estos temas que se anunciará más tarde. Borough President Adams would also like to remind viewers that comments can be submitted by email to askeric at BP. Dot NYC dot gov. This hearing is now adjourned. El presidente Adams también le gustaría recordar a los visitantes que los comentarios se pueden enviar por correo electrónico al ask Eric a Brooklyn BP punto N I C punto G O V. Esta audiencia ahora está disponible. Gracias. Buena noche. Good night. Thank you, Richard, David, Ina, and Denise for all your work tonight.
Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Richard. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night. And thank you to the community that stayed with us for a long evening. So appreciate that. Yes. Yeah.